Vale, hello everybody and welcome to some more Hemlock Vale hype rating where we're going to rate the cards out of five for Hemlock Vale before we get any meaningful time playing with them. And then in one year we're going to look back at these and see how right and or wrong we were. Last week uh, on the channel I did the level zero cards and all the investigators. There's going to be a link in the description where you can check those out. But today we are going to be talking about the experience cards. So we have a bunch of cards to talk about all uh, finishing this all up. Uh, I'm going to be having my Twitch chat who is here with me while I'm recording this live on Twitch. Also ranking the cards so we can look at their differences um, for how they differ to me um, in terms of like the average vote uh, across the Twitch chat and then also you know they can also participate to see how right and or wrong they were in one year's time. Uh, my personal rating scale is a five is a card that is it does a lot. It does a lot in one package and it pushes your game forward in a way that is just completely incredible and kind of like what it does is really really powerful. So like five is like an absolute banger. Notably, I think I only gave like two fives, not counting investigators. I actually only gave one five, push to the limit. I think it was the only card I gave a five last. Oh no, a long shot. Long shot was the only card I gave a five to from last week because that card is really good. Ankaken, thank you so. Anka Khan, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. I said your name wrong at first, but thank you so much uh, for the Twitch Prime. Uh, welcome to two months at the Golden Table. Uh, four is a card that I think is very, very good, if not excellent. Um, three is a card that is just, like, a good card. Uh, two is a card that I think we're getting to, like, a little bit, like, fine to, like, below fine. And then one is a card that I think is ultimately unplayable. Or close to unplayable. Um, and... Yeah, I said last week that there's going to be a lot of cards that are kind of just going to kind of hover around a three, and I think that holds true today as well. Um, this is a card, this is an expansion that I don't think there's a lot of cards that to me really uh, jump out as like absolutely bonkers, busted, broken, um, but there's just a lot of good cards that are just like good. So we're going to be taking all that into account, and I think that's all I have to talk about here. Um... Let me just uh, get this get this all ready. How good is this card? And then we go one, two, three, four, five. So our first card that we're going to start off with today is Hand-Eye Coordination. So this is a one-cost event in the Guardian class. It's an insight. Uh, it's fast. Play only during your turn as an action. Oh, so resolve an action ability on a tool or weapon asset you control without paying its action cost. So... Because there's less cards, I, I want to try to dive into, especially like these experience cards, because the idea of experience cards is to really round out your deck or ultimately be what your deck is built around. So like, what does hand-eye coordination do, right? It only discounts one action, which is a little bit of a downside, um, because like, it's basically just like, it's, it's like a cheaper, but more restrictive, but cost more XP version of that one rogue card that no one plays that's basically Skid's ability. Um... I don't know. I don't really know about this one, right? Like, what does it actually do that's, like, super exciting? Like, I don't think the card is, like, bad, right? Um, but it doesn't also reduce the cost of... It doesn't, like, reduce the cost of the ammo, right? So you're just, like, getting one action. Um, you're getting one action that... You just get to fire your gun. Which is good, right? Like, in big gun decks, I think especially, I don't think you want to run this in, like, melee weapons because your melee weapons kind of just, like, win it, you know? The pull time was very short. It's, it's always been a minute. It's, al it's, it's always a minute for these one cards. It's always a minute for these ones. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to find, like, when I would use this card. Like, for me, my gut is telling me that I would want to use this card in, like, a shotgun deck. But I feel like it needs to be, um, it needs to also, like, ignore without paying its cost, right? Like, I think it also needs to just, like, give you an ammo, right? Because I think right now, this card's not going to see much play. Like, I think people are going to play it, and they're going to, like, shoot their gun with it. Um, and that's it. 
I think I'm going to go with a 2.5 for this card. I don't think this card is particularly exciting to me, and I don't think the card itself is going to be particularly powerful. All right. Let's move on to our next card, which is Strong Armed, otherwise known as My New Love and Silas. Silas gets two Vicious Blows this expansion. Strong Arm is a skill. It's an 8. While well, Strongarm is committed to an attack using a melee or ranged asset, this attack deals plus one damage. After revealing Chaos Tokens for the skill test, you may take one damage to cancel that Chaos Token, return the Chaos Bag, and reveal a new one. So, uh, this card doesn't work with Firearms, which is where I'd actually want to play it. Like, I would want to play this card, I think, most commonly in a Shotgun deck, right? Um, because it's protection for your Shotgun, and more the more protection you get for your Shotgun, the better, right? Does tell the chat average? I didn't tell you the chat average for the last card. You guys gave it a 3.5. You guys gave uh, hand-eye coordination a 3.5. Um, so apart from like that, um, like I, I think that's like, I think the card's good. I think, I think it's a good card. Um, I don't think it's as good as chat thinks. Chat is giving it a really high number. Holy heck. Chat, you guys gave it a 4.6. Whew! You guys are a lot higher on this card than I am. I think the card's good. I think it's a good card. Um, I, I, I think my big issue with this, though, is that I don't know... Um, I don't know how much how much you really need in a majority of the investigators another vicious blow, right? Um, vicious blow is a very good Arkham Horror the card game card. There's no denying it, right? Um, but it's 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 one of those things that I think that just like to me like your guys is raining of the of giving it fives and fours imply to me that this is a card that I would want to put everywhere. And I don't think I would want to put this card everywhere. I actually think that, like, a lot of goons don't need more Vicious Blow across the board. And I think if this came out a lot earlier, I would be more inclined to agree with the high rating, right? Um, but I think that, like, overall, there you could just do better things with a lot of cards. Like, I don't think you need... Um, I don't think you need four Vicious Blows in a lot of Guardian decks. Um, because you're kind of just like already killing it, you know? I feel like I put this in every Guardian I play most because I hate the auto fail. That implies cowardice. Don't be scared of the auto fail. It's not going to hurt you. As someone who's been hurt by the auto fail, it's less bad than you think. And that's why I think this card is really missing it, right? Because like... I think the only time that you want to be using the ability most often, right, is, like, the, um... Like, that's why, like, I, I, this screams shotgun, right? It screams shotgun to me because that's where you want your protection. Like, you want your protection for your tokens in firearms, like, with using when you have to spend ammo, right? Um... When you have to, like, spend your ammo to do things, right? With a melee weapon, you just are like, okay, I missed. I'm going to just swing again, right? Um, so I'm going to give this card... I think it's a, I think it's a very good card. I'm going to give it a 3.5, though. I don't think it's... It's not up there with the 4 for me. I think 4.6 is a little bit... A little bit crazy, and chat's huffing some copium right there for that one. All right. Next up, we got Second Wind Level 2. All right. An upgraded version of an old classic. Zero cost, two experience event. Spirit and bold. Play only as your first action. Heal two damage. Three damage instead. If you drew a treachery this round, draw one card. So I think Second Wind is a playable deck in... A playable card in Mark Harrigan, right? I usually don't put it in other places. Um, mostly just because I think other places have, like, generally better healing that you can just take advantage of... Um, take advantage of in other ways. So, like, Second Wind doesn't really move the needle for me and other Investigators. Uh, would I upgrade this in a Mark Harrigan deck? Yes, I would. But I think otherwise this card is just here to just, like, continue to fill out um, this thing where every card needs to get an upgrade, right? Um, 
just because of like you know down the rabbit hole is eventually going to consume and take everything <laughs> take everything from us and soon everyone's going to be playing down the rabbit hole decks because it would be incorrect not to um but i think otherwise this card is just kind of like um here and there's nothing uh wrong with it i think you guys gave it a 2.5 in chat land i'm honestly right there with you 2.5s across the board yeah it's just like if you, I mean, like, it, I, I only play second win in Mark Harrigan, essentially, and I would play this upgraded version in Mark Harrigan. Because, I mean, like, three damage is a lot for zero resources, but I think that most of the time you can be fine getting away with it. All right. We're going on to cleaning kit level three. Uh, three cost, three experience. Uses four supply. Supplies on cleaning kit may be spent as if they were supplies on ammo or assets you control. Takes up the accessory slot as a reaction. Uh, when a supply is spent from cleaning kit, exhaust it. The performing investigator gets plus two skill value for this test. I think this card's really cool. Um, what did I give the original cleaning kit? I gave it a 3.5. I don't know if this card is notably better than the original funnily enough i think they're like better for different reasons like they're like you, you you like there's a reason to play each of them but i don't think like the upgrade is going to just in a vacuum do that much more than the original version because the original version of what gives you it's like has one less use on it right i think that's kind of like the thing and you obviously don't get the plus two um but once again down the rabbit hole stonks are going up through the roof um <laughs> And we're going to be trapped in the down the rabbit hole thing forever going forward. Uh, let's see what you guys gave it. Uh, you guys gave it a 3.8. If I could give it a 3.8, I would. I think that's actually like a really good rating for it. Um, but I mean like this card lives for shotgun, right? I mean, like, at the same time, I mean, the thing is, like, it's level 3, so Guardians don't really need the plus 2. Like, if this was level 2 and, um, and uh, Rogues could run it and they could take advantage of it, I think that would be really sick. I think I'm going to still just give this one a 3.5. I think I'm going to give it the exact same rating as the other one because it's different. Like, I want this in a shotgun deck, you know? I want this in a shotgun deck, um... But, like, I don't really need it in other places. Like, I could see me running this in a Mark deck where I'm running Shotgun and the Colt. Because then there's, like, a reason to use it in both my weapons. But I think I'm going to give it a 3.5. And, yes, I I, I do acknowledge... I, I'm already sick of it. I do acknowledge that Ornate Bow is good with Cleaning Kit. People need to chill about that. <laughs> Oh, like, okay, yeah, it's good. It's good with, it's good with, uh, RNA Bow. Yes, it is. I, I've heard it a million times. It is good. It is good. And I look forward to doing it, but, you know. All right. Next up, we got Blessed Blade 4. And this is actually one of the few cards that I actually have some experience in, in this cycle. And this card's really good. Albeit very, uh, sinfully boring. All right. Um, Blessed Blade 4, 3 cost, 4 experience, takes up the hand slot. Uh, as an action fight, you get plus 2 fists for this attack. If the attack is, attack is successful, it deals plus 1 damage. Return each blessed token revealed during this attack to the chaos bag before revealing chaos tokens to the attack. You may exhaust Blessed Blade to add 2 blessed tokens to the chaos bag. Um. Yeah, uh, this card's good. It's very good. It's a very powerful weapon. Um, it's very consistent. If you are taking advantage of blessed tokens, it's going to become even better. If you're not taking advantage of blessed tokens like me, it's still just like good. Um, it's pretty expensive for experience. Um, I mean, I do think that four is probably the best place for it. But it notably does cost a lot. It costs one less than Time Worm Brand. And this is kind of doing an impersonation of Time Worm Brand. Just like a little bit cheaper in like the experience cost and the resource cost. Um, I don't think, I think it's a bit strange that this card actually doesn't cause Bless to resolve. I like to, like to, sorry, not resolve, that's not the right word. To go away when you draw them, when you play it. Check, I gave it a 3.8. 
I'm going to assume that's because Astute Dunsparce gave it a 1. Because Astute Dunsparce is rating with emotion right now, not... <laughs> Not card evaluation, just like, you know, hates the card. Which I respect! I respect anyone who wants to say they hate a card. Um, okay. Before this card came out, I think you could advocate for Time Warm Brand in every color. I'm not sure I'm happy Brand gets its lunch eaten. I mean, I don't, I'm okay with Brand. I honestly don't think Brand was worth it most of the time. <laughs> so I'm okay if Brand is... I, I, to me, Brand was never really playable in the first place. So I'm not actually upset that it's outclassed because I think it's outclassed by a majority of melee weapons that already exist in the game. So I don't think this is too much in comparison. Um, what am I going to give this card? I mean, I think it's a good, I think it's a very good weapon. I think it's a very good weapon. I think it's, like I said, I think it's going to be very boring. It's it's kind of like, like, it's a worse, obviously it's worse than um, the hammer. The hammer is better, um, just generally. If you're using blesses, obviously this card's better. I'm going to give it a four, I think. Ran is a niche that nothing else filled. You mean a one-handed melee weapon in the neutral class? <laughs> I don't under, like, I think Brand is fine. Like, I, I, th I don't think this... I mean, like, in a Guardian's, like... I, if a Guardian, I don't think playing Brand was the right choice anyway. Because you just have better weapons. Brand, to me, was always a survivor card. I'm gonna give Blessed Blade 4 a 4. Because it's 4. Okay. The Eyes of Illusia... start this poll. This is an interesting card. I don't think it's good, though. Uh, Eyes of Illusia. Three cause, four experience. Takes up the hand in an uh, arcane slot as an action parlay. Choose an enemy at location until the end of the round. Each investigator gets plus one skill value while fighting, evading, or parlaying with a chosen enemy. Place one resource on Eyes of Illusia as a charge. As a lightning mold, search your bonded cards for Blade of Yoth and swap with Eyes of Illusia. Moving all charges from Eyes of Illusia to Blade of Yoth. Uh, bonded... Spend an, uh, spend an action, spend one of three charges. Fight for this attack. You may use Brain instead of Fist. You get plus two skill down and deal plus one damage for each charge spent as part of this action's cost. As Lightning Bolt, you can search it uh, and you can swap back to the Eyes of Illusia. So, I think this card's really interesting. Um, and I was actually theorycrafting this one um, with Eric. We recorded a video talking about all the cards. And we kind of just... Uh, in that conversation, I kind of just realized that this card is kind of just like a boss killer, right? I think that's like where the home where this card um, does the most of its like juice. Most of the juice that you squeeze out of this card is to kill a boss. Because like the idea is, is that you guys are giving it a three, by the way. I think that's pretty fair. I don't know where I am on this yet. I need to take some time. So, like, the idea is that you use this card throughout the game to parlay with enemies to put a bunch of charges on it. And then once it comes time to fight the boss, you swap into the, you swap into the other mode and you just attack a bunch of times and deal a bunch of damage, right? Um... I think it's really cool. Like, I think it's a really cool card. Um, the flavor of it is pretty neat. The problem is also actually that parlay action. That parlay action is a little bit awkward, right? Because, I mean, like, I feel like if this is going to have a home, it's going to be in a flex. Where you're just like, oh, hey, there's an enemy here. I'm going to just parlay with it and then kill it with my other weapon. And while I'm also still getting clues, you know? Can Alessandra use it? I'm pretty sure Alessandra can use it. She has parlay on it. So this is always one to one on actions for damage. Yes. So basically, yeah, you're you're basically banking. You're you're basically charging up your laser, right? Playing a Marie for her spell action. That's interesting. Um. That's interesting. But yeah, you're basically banking up your actions to do a bunch of damage later. Again, I I I I don't think this card is particularly great. The question is, do I think it's bad or just fine? 
I agree is that it's I think it's very tuned for higher player counts for sure like I think that like a Carson could hold this in his hand parlay with a bunch of enemies uh let other people let them be like I'm gonna parlay with this enemy three times you get to attack it at plus three uh, and then when the boss comes, Car uh, Carson goes, you motherfucker, I've been here the whole time. And then just, like, gets plus six and deals plus three damage to the boss for, like, three swings. I, I think that is a good use case for it. But I want to look at this card as just, like, in its general, like, home, right? I'll be honest, in practice, this could be a card that I could look back in a year and be like, you know what, I was wrong about my rating for Eyes of Belugia. But I also could be pretty right. I'm going to give it a 3. I'm not sold on it, but I think it's a good card. But I don't think it's particularly very good, you know? I like it, though. I like the design of the card a lot. I don't think every card, even if it costs four experience, needs to be a banger. I think that there can just be cool cards in the game, you know? I think that there can be cool cards in the game. Yeah. It, uh, you know, the PAX is, I mean, I'm not surprised PAX is 100% right. But PAX is 100% right. It, it's, the, it's hard to track the value on this card, but the value is there, right? Like, it, but it's hard to just track the value on this card without, like, actually seeing it in action. I agree with that completely. That's a, that's a perfect way of, of putting it. All right. Let's go on to Flurry of Blows, which I think is a very, very fun card. But the question is, do I think this card's good? And let's find out. I haven't really thought about it. That's kind of like what I'm doing. I'm looking at these cards and thinking about if I think they're good uh, for a lot of these for the first time. All right. Two cost, five experience. Tactic, double faded. I'll just make sure my wife's not saying anything. Oh, she's just asking how I am. How nice of her. Uh, play only if you control a melee asset. As it's just a cost to play Flurry of Blows, spend an action. As an action, fight. Choose a melee asset control and take an immediate fight action with that asset without paying its cost. You may repeat this effect up to three times, and after the final attack resolves, if it is your turn, end your turn. Um, so what this card makes me think of in like a kind of not direct but close comparison is 1-2 Punch. Because I'm looking at 1-2 Punch as like the pinnacle of a good fight event in guardian that's kind of like what we look at as like a good 5 xp fight event in guardian right so this is similar to that in my opinion whoa chad you guys are all over the place for this one that's very interesting uh, nah, 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 nah. so you guys are giving it a 3.5 overall between you but we had uh five fours we had four twos wild and two fives hanging out in there as well Okay, now let's talk about it. So you guys gave it a 3.5. What am I going to give it? Do I think this card is good? I mean, I think the card is playable. So it's going to get, like, baseline 2.5. We nailed it. So let's go from there. You use this. You probably only run one of these in your deck, right? What rating would 1-2 punch get? Great question. I, I, I guess that's too deep for me right now. <laughs> that's too deep for me. Hmm. I mean, I like it. It has a lot of damage. It's like, so like when I look at this card, what I see for this card is you hold it in your hand and you um, use it to kill a boss, right? You just like bring it out against the boss and you're like, hey boss, like get fucked. You're dead. And I'm the reason you're dead. So get ready for, like, you know, that. One of the weapons you're pa pairing with this? Honestly, like, any non-zero weapon that's a melee weapon is going to be sick with this, right? Yeah, once, I mean, once again, Pax has got it, right? I just get packs on the show. <laughs> and I could just nod and whatever Pax says. Because I agree. It's a singleton boss killer that if you see it in time, you're stoked. And if not, you drew your other cards. And that's sick. This probably goes under stick to the plan as an emergency release valve. That's some cool tech. That's some cool tech. I mean, I think... It, I, honestly, I'm gonna... 
I need to see this card in action. I'm going to give this card a 3. Point oh, you guys gave it a 3.5. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give it a 3.5. I think the card is actually, it's actually pretty legit. If it is, it's just, it's, you're going to run one copy of it in your deck, and you're going to fight a boss. And if you can put it on your stick to the plan, um, that's awesome, right? Because you just basically punch the dude, then you play Flurry of Blows, and you punch the dude uh, four, more, four more times, right? You're basically just attacking, with this card, you're attacking what? Five times on your turn? That's pretty all right. How about this? You can move, move, one, two, punch, but can't do that with this. Is that a thing that matters? I don't think that matters. I don't think that matters, no. I think that one, two, punch is easier to slot in, especially as a two of, but I don't think it's, I don't think the, the double is going to matter too much for this one because you're just holding this to kill bosses. Two actions for four attacks where hand-eye coordination is uh, plus two attacks. Same amount of action economy for three attacks. One XP versus five XP. All right, we got we to gotta look at this. We got to dive in deeper. Two actions for four attacks. Whereas hand-eye coordination gets two actions. Same amount of action economy for three attacks. All right. Let's go back. Let's actually see if this is true. Do, 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 do. So, with uh, hand-eye coordination, you get to attack four times in your turn, right? For one cost, you get to do four actions. With this one, you get to do five attacks? Isn't it more? Because you get to do one attack normal, and then you can do four more attacks. You can do five attacks. So only one more. So two hand-eye coordinations equals one flurry of blows. But that's two more cards. You know what? Maybe. Maybe it's true. Maybe it is poopy. I don't think so, though. You need very little... Preliminary calculations are saying 5 greater than 4, but it's true. But then, then we have to get to the next question. Is 5 greater... How much greater is 5 than 4? Two actions for 4 attacks. Just 2 attacks. Interesting. Alright, let's go back and look at hand-eye coordination. It's an insight. So you can't lock it on something. You need to actually draw and find it. Being able to lock down your flurry of blows is pretty interesting. Like, the inside tag, I think, is worse for a majority of uh, Guardian Investigators. Yeah, how much better is one than two? Because one is less than two. You know what? I think you've convinced me, though. I'm going to actually drop the Flurry of Blows down to a three. I think you convinced me on that. I still think Flurry of Blows is a playable card, but that did... That is a fair point. But I don't think Flurry of Blows is a bad card. Like, I think if you play Flurry of Blows, you're going to probably win a game of Arkham Horror. But I do think that, yeah, if you look at the pure action economy to what's actually already in this box, it is less valuable. But I don't think uh, Flurry of Blows is bad. I think if you think Flurry of Blows is bad, you might be bad, but I don't think it's, like, great. I think it's very playable, though. All right. Let's go on to Miracle Wish. Alright, this is an X-Cost event. Five experience. Fast, play after one or more blessed tokens are revealed during a skill test of your location. Search your bonded cards for Evanescent Ascension to put into play. Place up to X resources on it as wishes to a maximum of the number of uh, blessed tokens revealed. Remove a miracle wish from the game. Uh, bonded. If Evanescent Ascension has no wishes, set it aside out of play. When an investigator is a reaction, when an investigator location would fail a skill test, spend one wish and exhaust Evanescent Ascension. Resolve that investigator's Elder Sign effect. In addition to all their tokens revealed. Okay. I think this card is really cool. I think uh, that this card is kind of like a fun idea. But I don't think... Um, uh, it's particularly good. <laughs> Mateo doesn't need this. I actually argue that Mateo would want this. Not because it would make him better, but because Mateo is kind of needing something that makes him a bit more interesting and i think that this is a way for him to actually be legitimately really um have an interesting another build around 
Because I think right now the problem with Father Mateo is that he doesn't really do anything interesting. Chat, you guys are giving it a 2.4. Be able to buy an Amelia deck creation. I mean, I think that's fine. If, if my father Mateo spent the first five experience of their deck on this, I would be like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> All right, so let's talk about, I think, why this card isn't good. And it should be pretty obvious. How likely are you going to be able to um, get, like, how many blessed tokens do you want on this, right? Um, and you probably want... Like, if I do less than three... I'm kind of sad, you know? But to do three, which let's just say like that is like our baseline. We want three uses out of this, which I think is like a pretty fair baseline, right? Um, we need to reveal three blessed tokens in one test, and we need to have three resources, and we need to be sitting on this card. And then we don't get a lot of use out of it because it's kind of just like a granny orn for a lot of places, right? And like, yes, you can build around it. Like as the people in chat are saying, you can like use Kohaku, you can use Favor of the Sun. But now you're like supplementing your 5 XP card with other XP cards, right like with or with other cards and like that's a combo and combos are cool but combos aren't necessarily always worth it right um and yeah it's very strange that it I, when i first read this card when i was doing spoilers i thought it replaced the token but no you just gotta also resolve that token so this is where like uh mark harrigan or uh agnes baker truly get to live where they get their plus x uh elder signs because everyone else is like plus one, plus two. That might still cause you to fail. And that's why I think this would be really interesting with Father Mateo. Because I think Father Mateo's whole space that he should be exploring is resolving his Elder Sign, right? That's where I think Father M Mateo is super interesting. And I think this would be a good piece for that. Not that I think it would make him that much better. Because I think the card in and of itself is also still kind of janky. But I think it would be a nice home for him to further explore. Does it count as a healing card if resolving my elder sign heals? No, we're not gonna. We're not runers here. This is a this is a no runer zone. Um, I think I'm actually gonna give this card a two. I think there's a lot of hoops to jump through. What if Father Mateo taking this for his five XP was Bryn? Would you be surprised then? Honestly, I'd be surprised. That, I, I'd be my surprise would be Bryn just playing Father Mateo. That would be my. My big level of surprise before he even like bought anything. Like if he bought Miracle Wish, I'd be like, oh, that makes sense, you know? Because Bryn playing Father Mateo would be the most surprising thing. Well, he has a plus two Elder Sign. Yeah, I mean, I think there's cases where it is better. Like you know, like I think in Lily it would be super interesting, but I don't know how much that changes the power level of the card for me in and of itself, you know? All right, well, this, is a, this is a cool card. I really am intrigued by this card, and I'm excited to talk about it a bit and put my thoughts on this card outside for the first time. Gabriel Carrillo. Four costs, one experience. Takes up a, uh, an ally slot because he's an ally. Soaks for two and one. You get plus one book, and at the start of your turn, add one curse stone to the chaos bag to draw a card. So, I think, if I had to name, say, one complaint about this card, I wish his reaction was forced. I think that this card would be more interesting um, if it was forced. Not because I think it would make him worse or better, I just think it would make him more interesting, you know? Um, I think he's a very good ally. I think he's a very good uh, Seeker ally. He has all the things that Seeker allies want. Cost four and give a book. <laughs> Um, I think this dude's pretty good. I think this dude's pretty good, right? Would you agree to Forced but level zero? No, no, I think he's, I think Forced but as he is right now. I think the Forced makes it more interesting. Um, because most people are going to draw anyway. But then there's going to be the time where you don't want to. And you're suddenly like, oh, but I have to. You know, I think that just makes a card just inherently more interesting to me. Chat, you guys are giving it a 4.4. 4. 
I'm up there with you. I think this is a very powerful Arkham card. It's just a question of how powerful do we think it is. The fact that he's in Miskatonic traded is interesting to me. I love archaeology funny. Whenever I see someone without Miskatonic, I think about being able to use their soak. Can I be honest? I just assumed this guy was Miskatonic because everyone in fucking Seekerville is Miskatonic. Uh, I like this guy. I like him. I'm, I'm, I'm hovering between a 4 and a 4.5. I don't think he's going to get a 5 from me. But I really like him. I'm going to give him a 4.5. I think this is a very good card. I'm going to give him a 4.5. I think this card is fucking is sick. And I'm excited to play with it. Um, and I guess my question is how often I'm going to play him outside of Curse decks. And I think I can still play this guy relatively often outside of Curse decks. Because, like, that's where we look at, like, to me, this guy isn't curse. It's just a punishment for getting, um, a free, a free card draw, right? Sick Harvey card? Yeah, Harvey, Harvey's gonna fucking love this card. He's gonna love him more than Kohaku does. Because there are a couple, right? This is Kohaku's partner. Am I right with that? Okay. Nice. All right. I have to keep I have to keep in, in the loop of who's fucking who in this game just so I can you know have that and have that in the data bank. I love this car. Is it good? Let's find out. This is steady handed. So this is a seeker asset for one experience. It's a talent and a science. The one per investigator. When you succeed at a skill test, exhaust steady handed. You either succeed by one more or one less. If you succeed by exactly two, heal one horror. Uh, I think this card is... So, I'm working with the theory that I think this card is fine to actually include in people who aren't trying to take advantage of it. That's my... That's my theory on this card. I think this card is fine for anyone, really. Limit one is good. Oh, if this didn't have a limit, that would be fuck. <laughs> that would be fucked. I mean, it would actually, I don't know if it'd be that fucked, but it is probably good. It's probably like it'd be like too fucked if you could do two of these in play. So, to me, uh, we're gonna get a three point um, five here. I can already tell that from you guys. Three point five, and you know what? I'm kind of like right there with you. Worse, Peter Sylvester. I don't think that's a fair comparison because one's an ally. <laughs> one's an ally. <laughs> and this is a slotless card. It's any skill test. Woo! It is any skill test. So, what I like about this card... Obviously, in Rex, this card is bonkers, right? Obviously, in Rex, this card is, like, exactly what Rex wants. Uh, Rex is gonna go fucking nuts about this card. Right? Like, now with Rex, you just get in the thick of it and just buy this and put two horror on Rex, right? Like, that's just your first thing you do, right? You buy one of these, or even two. Rex could play two, and you just go with it. Um... The question is how, like, I mean, I, I, th I think no one's upset if they put this in their deck. But, like, would you want to? Probably not, right? Unless you were trying to do this. If you're playing, like, the science chemistry stuff, I think this is really good. I think I like 3.5. I think I think this card's actually pretty legit. Let me give it a 3.5. I'm with you on that one, chat. Something, something, Katana. Let's go! Yes, and also, yeah, like, I think also, like, things that, in scenarios that reward you by succeeding by, this card's also going to get some boost there. Yeah, and being able to cheat your chemistry set, I think, is also really sick. Or even, like, your uh, Dr. Charles West the third, I think that's also notably a good thing for him as well. It's going to make him rel more reliable. And I kind of want to try that uh, Joe deck with this and Dr. Charles West. Joe Diamond, I think that's going to be good. Okay, uh, what's next? I'm pretty sure. 
it is fine tuning. All right, fine tuning is a two cost event, one experience. Attached to a two or science asset, you control them in one per asset. After attached asset exhaust has a reaction, exhaust fine tuning and a ready attached asset. So I think this card's like quite playable, right? This card's gonna break something one day. I do agree. I do agree. You know what I'm just most excited about? <laughs> to put this in Trish and just use my lockpicks twice a turn. Let's go. Hmm. I mean, I don't really have much to say about this card. I think this card's just, like, good. It has a very high ceiling. Right? What it attaches to is going to depend on lot, a lot on what, on what you're doing with it. Chat's giving it a 3.6. I'm honestly right there with you. I think these Seeger cards uh, have been really good. I'm going to give it a 3.5. I think it's just a, it's a, it's a good card. It's a very good card. Um, yeah. These Seeker cards have been pretty good, and they're only going to be getting better as we go. <laughs> they're only going to be getting better. Alright, Esoteric Method. It's Promise of Power, but different. So Esoteric Mer uh, Method is a one experience skill, practice cursed. Uh, after the skill test ends, add one cursed token to the Chaos Bag. For each point, uh, the Performing Investigator either succeeded or failed by. Um, Promise of Power is a very good card. However, with that said, Promise of Power is really good because it costs zero. So when I see Esoteric Method, I actually don't see Promise of Power. I see... Curse generation, because that's what this card screams to me, right? This card screams, "Hey, I want to put a bunch of um, a bunch of curse tokens into the bag, right?" Uh, I'm using promise of power to pass a test. I'm using esoteric method to pass a test, but also put a bunch of curse tokens in there. Um, also, yes, I do agree. This is kind of just a fair promise of power, because promise of power in and of itself. I've said that three times today. In and of itself, I need to stop saying that. It's just my new saying of the day. Uh, Promise Power, Promise of Power is just like a very, very good card. Um, chat, you guys are giving this a three. I'm right there with you. Oh no! I'm right there with you. I think this card is good, so I'm gonna give it a three. What about practice makes perfect users who have no access to purple? I don't think so. I think you really, I think it really wants, um... I think you really... Like, you could. I don't think it's a bad choice. I don't think it's bad. But I don't think it's... I think you can just find better skills if you're not in purple and your practice makes perfect. Right? Because, I mean, I think at that point, if you're looking for practiced cards and you're, like, desperate and you're like, I want this, I think there's just better options, right? Like, if I was looking for wilds, I don't know. I don't know. But I, if I'm playing Curses, I want this in my deck. If I'm playing Curses, I want this in my deck. And speaking of playing Curses, we got some Prismatic Spectacles. Alright. The Prismatic Spectacles. Two cost, two experience. It takes up the accessory slot. Item Relic Cursed. As an action, add one Cursed Token to Cast Bag. Investigate. You get plus two skill value for this investigation. If a Cursed Token is revealed to its investigation, you may exhaust Prismatic Spectacles to discover one additional clue at your location. Yeah, I think this is a cool card for Cursed decks. How do they not take the mask slot? I mean, we actually should have had a face slot, right? Which is just like a face in the corner going like this. And then it should have been that. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think the, I, I think the card's good, right? I, like, once again, I don't have much to say about this card. I mean, I, I can complain about how people, um, don't, how people didn't know <laughs> that this card, you need to, like, pass the test to get the additional clue. Um, but that's just me being a little bit of a, of a butthead, and I don't really want to be a butthead right now, so I'm not going to complain about that too much. Like, I'm happy to be a butthead, but I don't think we need to be a butthead about that. Jay, you guys gave it a 3.5? I'm debating between 3 and 3.5, personally. I mean, the plus two skill value beats the curse token that you're looking to draw. I think I'm going to give it... I think I'm going to give it a... Th oh, I don't know, man. I feel like it's a 3.25 to me, and I'm just trying to decide if I round up or down. My gut tells me to round down. Because I feel like this is going to sit with a lot of the curse stuff where you need to be cheating a little bit to get the extra clue. Like the plus two, like the plus two skill value is nice, but I think I would rather just run like Grim, not uh, Grim Memoir for that, you know? I think I'm going to give it a three. I'm going to give this card a three. I think it's very good though. But I, I think I'm just going to have to like respect the three here. That's supposed to 3.5. I don't disagree with 3.5, though. Like I said, I was hovering between the two. Um, but I just think that the... It has that curse baggage, like the Armageddon baggage, if you will, or the Eye of Chaos baggage, where you kind of need to build around it to really make sure you're triggering the full potential of your card. And that's kind of how I'm looking at it, like triggering the full potential of the card, where we at, and where we go. Where we at? Where we at? All right. Con confound. Okay. So this is a three experienced, two cost event, parlay. It's an insight and a trick. Rita. Choose an enemy at your location in test book X, where X is the chosen enemy's evade value. If you succeed, discover two clues at your location. Then, if the chosen enemy is non elite, automatically evade it. It does not ready during the next upkeep phase. So, uh, this actual, a little fun fact about this card that actually Eric pointed out to me, I did not realize, this card has the then on it, which means that if you don't discover two clues with this card, you actually don't get to evade the enemy, right? So, uh, if you ever are, like, at a location and you just grab one clue with this, it doesn't actually evade the enemy because the then has to resolve in full, which I think is a little bit interesting, and I think it's also actually something uh, I want to keep. I'm going to be keeping in mind as I evaluate this card. Uh, we're going to go with 3.3 .3 on this for you guys. Uh, sorry, you guys gave it a 3.3. .3. That's what Chat gave it. Are we super sure? I mean, Eric and I did look it up. I'll look it up again for you right here. I'll look it up again for you. But the then, uh, then implies, well, then actually not implies, then says that you have to do everything. Uh, if the effect of the ability includes the word then, the text preceding the word then must be successfully resolved in full before the remainder of the effect described after the word then can be resolved. So... I think this is actually um, a knock against the card. Uh, I, I think it's less likely to actually be matter than you think because I think it's one of those things where you just like are going to park yourself on two shroud, uh, two clue locations if you do have it. But um, it is actually relevant, right? It is actually one of those things that uh, can kind of uh, fuck over this card a little bit in your hand, and and even like in your play pattern. 
And that's one of those things that I think, like, for three experience, you don't want to be having to do that. Fine with Clue Drop then? Amen. I think with Clue Drop, that's kind of fun. Uh, I, I think this card is good. I'm going to give it a three. I was going to give it a... Th I, like, before Eric pointed this out to me, I was going to give it a 3.5, probably. But I think a three is kind of also pretty... I mean, it's good, but it's I think it's, like, pretty notable for this uh for that card that then is very interesting isn't it the thing is most people won't know how that this how this card works that's true but i do so i have to i have to rate it with that uh with that knowledge because i can't escape that right that's in my soul forever all right microscope four All right, two cost, four experience. Takes up the hand slot, item tool, science. After an enemy location successfully evaded or defeated, place one resource on microscope as evidence. Double action, you get plus two book for this investigation breach. Evidence on microscope, max of plus six. If you succeed, you may spend up to three evidence to discover that many additional clues at your location. Off topic, when are we going to see four player Arkham? Probably never. I don't think it's ever going to happen. We're so adult now, and our schedules are so different, <laughs> that I don't think it's going to happen. What did I give Microscope 0? Probably a 3, right? I gave it a 3.5. <laughs> I don't disagree, but I'm, I'm hyped on it. I'm hyped on that uh, hype ranking, for sure. I think this card's powerful. It does cost 4 experience. Um... I assumed they meant in per in person four player Arkham because we've done a lot of four player digitally, but I assume they meant in person. Chad, you guys gave it a three point five. So I think um, <laughs> if I may be so bold, if I may be so bold for a second, I think that actually uh, the designers in this cycle, um. What's with all these action investigates on assets? Uh, may I interest you in a card called Lab Coat, which was implying that this was happening. <laughs> may I interest you in this card called Lab Coat from Scarlet Keys that was foreshadowing all this was happening. That's why there's so many investigate actions on assets. Um, I think the designers, for the most part, did a very good job of finding experience levels that I think are relatively fair for these cards, which leaves them in the spot where I think most of them are just probably, like, you know, good. Um... Dude. I think this card's... I, I, I've played with Microscope. I've played with Microscope, and Microscope is a, is a powerful card. Um, the Microscope Zero. I haven't played with Microscope 4, but I've seen the power of Microscope Zero. It's just a question of how much more is this one better than that, or potentially worse than that. Rather than like magnifying glass? No, that's boring. Magnifying glass. Honestly, magnifying glass, if it got deleted from the game, I would not be opposed. This is like a more interesting card, and I think it has a higher ceiling than magnifying glass, obviously. Yeah, two actions for four clues. I think this card's legit. I think this is a very powerful card. You also don't have to spend evidence unless you succeed. Which is good, because if you double actioned, failed, and I still have to spend evidence, that would be bad. I'm going to give this card a 4. I think this card's really good. This card's going to help you win games so much. So much. You just hang out with your goon. They kill three enemies. And then you're like, thank you. I will grab four clues from this location. Teamwork. Right? And then you just follow them around and you keep doing it. I think it's it has a lot of burst clue potential. <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good card. I think it's good. All right. Now we're going to get to the hot topic of this cycle, which is the Mykonids. All right. <clears throat> Ravenous Mykonid. Two cost, four experience. This is the sentient strain. 
Uh, creature Science is a lightning bolt. Search your bonded cards for uncanny growth and add it to your hand limit once per round. As a reaction, when an investigator draws a non-weakness treachery card, if their location shroud is equal to or less than Ravenous Mykonid's growth, cancel that treachery's effects and discard it. Remove all growth from Ravenous Mykonid. Uh, the Uncanny Growth is a one-cost event. Investigate after this test resolves. Place one resource on Mykonis, uh, on Ravenous Mykonid as growth. For each point you succeed by, set Uncanny Growth aside out of play. If you fail, return Uncanny Growth to your hand. Um, so I think this card's good. I think this card's very good. I don't think this card's broken like other people do. And I think the big reason for that is that I just don't think the Treachery deck is scary anymore. You know? Um, and I think that a lot of people who are four, five, six, seven, nine, two, three, four, five, and two, two ones. There's some spicy meatballs in chat today for sure, and I'm here for it because I'm Italian and I love spicy meatballs. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it's broken. Yeah, uh, I'm with you. It's broken if you try to break it, like a lot of things in this game. I think that's, like, what it comes down to, right? It's broken if you try to break it. But, like, honestly, I think of this... This one is, like, um... This one cancels the, the treachery effects. I, I just... Like, maybe it's just me, right? Um... Um... Maybe it's just me that I... I'm just not scared of treacheries anymore. Treacheries aren't scary. I think, like, this card would go up in value for me if treacheries were scary. Um, but I think that this one is, like, kind of not, um... Fatality. Kind of not, like... That's why it's not moving the needle for me as much as other people. I think it's a good card. Growl GG, thank you for your Twitch Prime subscription. Welcome to the Golden Table. It's a pleasure to have you. But I think that's kind of, like, what is making it not feel as broken for me is I'm just, like, not scared of treacheries anymore. Right? Um, what am I going to give it? You guys gave it a 4.1. I'm like, I think I'm right there with you. I, th I don't think it's a 4.5 for me. I think it's a very good card. Otherworldly Compass. Can I be honest? Can I, I'm going to say something that might sound a little rude, okay? <laughs> I'm going to say something, this, this might sound a little rude, but I don't mean it this way. A lot of the times when I've seen people talk about this card and the things you can do with it, it sounds like a bunch of spikes trying to be Johnny's. When a true Johnny is like, I don't care. And a true spike also, in my opinion, should look at this card and be like, I don't care. In my opinion. I'm just a guy on the internet, so what do I know, right? But... All this stuff about, like, these things you can do, it just seems like a lot of work that, like, just, like, pass the tests. <laughs> you know, like, just build your deck to survive a Mythos phase. You don't need to, like, worry about all this stuff. You don't need to translate this ravenous Mykonid. You can just, like, you know, like, do all this other stuff. Like, even, like, the whole idea of, like, being, like, really good and getting, like, a high book score and putting a bunch of stuff on this. Like, uh, in those decks, I've never, like, needed this card, you know? If you that sentence like something incredibly hurtful, can I tell you that I'm a content creator, okay? I'm a content creator and a lot of things that I say are taken out of context. So sometimes I put a little bumper on a statement, even if it's actually not the meanest thing in the world, uh, just because some people might and then I take it out of context. Hello, welcome to the internet, my friend. I think this card's really good, though. I think it's also very fun. Like, it's not lower than a 4. This card is, like, is banging. This card's very powerful. Um. Yeah. And I think, honestly, if you're setting up a nutty combo where you're doing things like, um. If you're doing things like doing this breach the door 
doing all this combo. I think congr you, you should be able to break the card, right? Because that's like what your deck does. Because like a deck that gets clues really efficiently should be good at its job. And a deck that's built around Maven Ravenous Mykonid should be canceling one investigator's... Uh, well, it doesn't exhaust. So like every investigator's if they're all camping on the same location. But even that also is just like changing your game pattern to play around this card. So if everyone is camping on the zero shroud location to just cancel the turns every turn you're just like picking it up putting it down and repeating this process that sounds like a group that is building around ravenous micing it to break it as opposed to ravenous micing it in like just by itself i'm trying not to say in and of itself again being a good card um like those are cool combos and i think combos like that should be rewarded because those combos honestly sounded this like um Honestly sound like a little bit like you're you're warping your game around the card as opposed to the card just generally being good. Um but I think the card's really fun. I'm gonna give this guy a four. I don't think he's the best of the bunch though. I don't think he's the best of the bunch, but I think he's very good. Now let's get to what I think is the best of the bunch, which is the carnivorous strain. All right, so this guy, same kind of stuff, but now you can choose a non-elite enemy at your location with equal or fewer remaining health and the amount of growth on Ravenous Mykonid. Defeat that enemy, remove all growth from Ravenous Mykonid. I think that killing monsters instantly is better than canceling treacheries because treacheries generally don't cost you actions, and if they do, um, most of the time it's like soak actions or um, you know losing actions by themselves. Uh, an enemy is a threat th th you need to answer now. So I just generally view enemies as scarier than treacheries, just like in like a blanket, a blanket level, right? So, um, it also, yeah, defeats the enemy too, right? <laughs> it does defeat the enemy. Um, so yeah, if it has VP, you get to do that again. Uh, I don't think that this is a five for me still. I think that there's a lot of like, you know, you have to like kind of, I mean, maybe it is a five. I don't, maybe... I don't know. I think this is more problematic than the other one. But also, like, at this point now, I'm riding the lightning, and I actually don't view a lot of things. Like, the things that I view... Chat, you guys gave it a 4.5. A lot of the things that I view as problematic for Arkham are kind of, like, just recursion at this point, you know? Mandatory, uh, brood of... Uh, yeah, yeah, it can be... It can defeat the broods. Which is kind of sick. He only need three on it too. That's really easy to hit. Okay. I, I think I'm right there with you. I'm going to give it a 4.5. I think right now my only five is long shot. That's actually really funny. My only five is long shot. Uh, there's a lot of things that can kill the broods. The broods are actually really easy to cheese now. Cheesing the broods is actually, like, super simple in this day in Arkham. That's, this is just, like, throw another one on the pile. There's actually stuff that does it at zero XP anyway, too, so. But the thing, I will also say, the thing about the Mykonids is that they are also progressing the game while doing this, which I think is a very important thing to note. These aren't just, like, cards that you have to do instead of progressing the game. Um, it's also... It's also doing this while progressing the game. And I agree. You don't need to, like, go high for this one. If you just kill a ghoul that someone draws, that's so much more that they can do, you know? I feel like this is a very dangerous design space. It eats up a lot of potential future card spaces, even in some current events. Why would I use upgraded uh, Etzling Neck over this? You mean the, do you mean the Disc of Itzamna? Um... And the reason is that you don't need to, like, dig it out of your deck. There's a lot, okay. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons to run other cards. I think people who say there's no reason to run this card are, like, actively, like, getting worse at the game that they're playing, right? There's a lot of reasons that you would want to run a Disc of Idzamna level 2 over Ravenous Mykonid. A big reason is the experience, right? 
You could, like experience. This costs four. You have to you have to get through it. You have to find it in your first deck. You need to upgrade it. You need to find it. A disc of Insomna at level zero will kill a two health enemy if you're killing that with Ravenous Mike in it, right? Like these are just like simple things if you just pull it back, right? Um, and two, yeah, two traits that aren't really searchable. The other one's an item, right? You can also, like, play it with, like, if you're playing, like, Unearth the Ancients, Disc of Zomna goes up in value. At this point now in Arkham, it's less that the cards are just generically good, but you need to be looking at your entire deck and asking, why am I making these decisions over other decisions? I think at this point now, there's a few cards that are just generically good, but there are other cards that just notably get better if you are building your deck around them. All right. Last little buddy here, our last Mykonid is the Nurturing Strain, which, I'll be honest, is kind of actually just the first one again. <laughs> um, so this guy is a Lightning Bolt. He soaks for 3 and 3. Uh, remove all growth from Ravenous Mykonid. Either heal that much damage and horror from Ravenous Mykonid, or remove that much damage and horror from Investigators or Ally Assets at your location to Ravenous Mykonid. Um, I think this one's also good. I think it's probably the worst of the three. But it's the one that I'm most interested in playing because I think it's the most interesting of the three. Which shouldn't be a surprise because the other two are kind of just like really good. Like they're also just like like, like really damn good. Um, but yeah, this one and um, the first one are kind of actually the same card if you look at it like in like damage and horror dealing treacheries. Um... So I'm between, I, I think every Mykonid's a four baseline, I think. I think these are all like, I think there's a reason to play all of these, the, the Mykonids. Alright. You guys gave this a 3.3. What is this cycle sled dog? That's a great question. I actually don't think there is a sled. I can't think of a sledge dog. Dude, this guy's going to soak so much for you. Basically kind of like... I don't know. Oh yeah, that is true. This guy might kill himself. <laughs> this plan might just take on too much for you. That's interesting. That is interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to give this guy... A 3.5. I think he is still very good. But yeah, I think that... There's a lot of work you need to do, and that's going to bring this guy down a bit. And I mean, I think this is pretty obvious. The 3.5... This guy is the lowest. Sentient is the second, and then the enemy one is the first. I think that's pretty fair. Because yeah, if you do succeed by too much, like, that's bad news, bear, bad news bears for this. Because he might just die. Right? Like, if he has one damage marked and you have five things on them, you now have to, like, you have to, like, balance between, you have to balance between taking one damage off of him or killing him, right? And you can recur him easily, right? It's tough. It's simultaneous. I don't think it's simultaneous. It's an or, right? Either heal that much damage and horror from Ravenous Mykonid, or move that much damage. It's not and or, right? It's like it's an either or, right? 
I don't read it as both. So it could take that much, yeah. Um, but you move it to it, right? So that's what that, that's what what Pax was saying, and I agree, right? Like if it has one damage on it, and you have five growth on it, you now need to choose: Hey, am I gonna move five damage and kill this guy, or am I gonna spend five growth to heal him and keep him alive, right? Which I think is to make this guy a little bit more finicky than you want a card like this to be. All right. British Bulldog. Would taking an ally slot be a fix for Ravenous? I don't think I don't think Ravenous might it needs a fix. I think the card's fine. Alright, British Bulldog. Three cost, two experience, takes up a hand slot. Item, weapon, firearm, illicit, uses three ammo as an action, spend one ammo, fight, you may use foot instead of fist for this attack, you get plus two skill value, this deck deals plus one damage, ignore the aloof keyword for this attack. Uh, as a reaction, if you fail a skill test while parlaying with an enemy, put British Bulldog into play from your hand. So do we agree that this card is should have been in the core set? No, I do not agree. I do not agree. Uh, I think that the rogue core set was... Uh, Fine. I think, honestly, like, the rogue in the core set, there's a reason why it's Bren's favorite class, right? Um, I think that this is a very nice addition to the game. What did I give the first one? I gave it a 3.5. I'm going to give this one a 4.5? I'm going to give this card a 4.5. You know what? Fuck it. I might give this card a 5. Ah, I don't think that's a bit much. I think that's a bit much, Justin. I think this card's very good, and it's gonna be uh, it's gonna shine in a lot of homes. Chat gave it a four point six. I'm gonna give it a four point five. I like that rating. Five was too high. I, I flew too close to the sun for a second there. Kimani going crazy. Every rogue's going crazy with this gun. Every rogue with high foot is gonna love this gun, right? Like every rogue loves this card. This is such a great addition to the card pool. And Wendy. Wendy's gonna love this gun. Uh, I don't even care about the parlay text, you know? This looks so much like shriveling, though. Yeah, it does look so much like shriveling. What? What's... What is... You people. <laughs> You're so weird. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't... I don't understand. Like... <laughs> Yeah, guns have all guns have like guns and spells have always been the same thing. <laughs> They've always been the same from the beginning. Like, what if I told you guns and spells are just like the same thing? They are. It's just they are. They're the same stuff. It's an asset that deals damage and gives you a boost. Um, but yeah, like every every rogue is gonna like well not every rogue because Preston exists. He can't even play it. But, like, every rogue with high foot is going to really benefit from British Bulldog. Because now they have, like, a good suite of guns that are, like, kind of popping off. And then Tony can still just use it normally. Slowly sad this devalues Sharpshooter. Yes, I think Sharpshooter at this point is dead in the water. And we should just, like, you know, pour one out for it. Because Sharpshooter... Sharpshooter should have been higher XP and a permanent from the get-go. Okay. Snitch. This card's really good, right? This card's pretty powerful. One cost, two experience event, fast play after you see the skill test while parlaying. Discover two clues from among your location and connecting locations. I think this card's good. That's a good effect. Um... I think in the right deck, you're going to want it in, right? Obviously, you want a deck where you're going to be parlaying at least somewhat co uh, consistently. I don't think you need to be in a full parlay deck to run this. I think if you have a few parlay effects, you can run one or two of these cards and probably get away with it. It'd probably be pushing it a little bit, right? I think it would be a little bit much, but I think you could.
Elder's Tongue makes this, though. Yeah, I mean, Recursion's powerful, right? Um, all right, let's see what you guys are giving it. You guys are giving it a 4.2. I'm not that high. I think this effect is powerful. It is weird they didn't print the community upgrade of fine clothes in the box. Uh, I don't think so. Because didn't that community thing happen, like, in, like, March? Wasn't the design already, like, I imagine the box was already finalized by then, right? I imagine that this box has been finalized for the last, like, year and a bit. This card's just, like, good, right? Two clues from your location and connecting locations. After you see skill test while parlaying, which is pretty easy in a parlay box. I'm not blown away by it, though. Like, I think it's good. In a parlay deck, I think it's good. What do I want to give this? I'm between, I'm like at a 3.75, and I'm just trying to decide if I'm going to round up or down. I think I'm going to round up just because I think this card is pretty legit. But I also kind of want to round down because I think you really need to be like parlaying hard to make this card work to the level that you want from this card. But it's only 2 XP. 2 XP is nothing. Yeah, I'm going to give it a 4. I think this card is pretty damn, pretty damn good. I think this card's pretty damn good. All right. Bewitching. Uh, this is a three call, a three experience, sorry, permanent exceptional asset, talent, and a trick. This reaction: before you draw your opening hand, search your deck for up to three different trick cards and attach them face down to Bewitching and shuffle your deck. Um, as a reaction, when you engage an enemy, exhaust Bewitching, either draw one attached card or switch top nine cards of your deck for a copy of the attached card, draw it, and shuffle your deck. I think this card's pretty, pretty good, right? I think this card's kind of, kind of awesome. How good is it? I think the effect is strong. I mean, like, Stick to the Plan is a powerful card, and this is, like, just Stick to the Plan, you know? Imagine the outrage if this was out of Rita's card pool. Yeah, that would, that would be a little bit much. I'm glad it's in Rita's card pool. It would be. It would not be great if it was out. Uh, a little expensive, but awesome. I mean, I do think that it's priced pretty fairly. Cards like this are very good, and like they sh like effects like this rather are very good, and they should probably be costed appropriately. Chat, you guys gave it a three point nine. I'm right where with you. I'm gonna give it a four. I think this is a very powerful card. We got a longer delay. I think the delay was out of... I think the delay was for reasons that weren't related to Arkham. I think that might be why we got the Parallel Investigators, because they were kind of just like, what do we do? Our, our, our own schedule was pushed back a few months because of something. The Royal Cards have been pretty good lately. I mean, like, effects like this are powerful. I also love the Search the Top 9. Depending on when it goes. So you just, like, kind of, like, bank up some easy marks in the time being. Throw some astounding revelations in your deck if you're Trish. Woo! Have some fun with it. Man, I like it. I like the card. I'm kind of debating if I want to give a cult shot and put this up even higher. 
I don't think so. I think I'm happy with four. All right, what's next? Dirty Deeds. This card seems pretty good. Rogue's got some, Rogue has got some nice experience cards this cycle. So you take a card that matches any of them. Yes, just any of them. You don't have to call it. You don't have to do your shout before. Uh, one cost, three experience. Favor, double illicit. Is initial cost to play Dirty Deeds. Spend an action. Search your deck for an illicit asset, play it, pay in its cost, and you may resolve an action or lightning bolt ability on the added asset, ignoring all costs. So no ammo is spent. Playing this card does not provoke attacks of opportunity. So I think that this is a double card that actually is like the easiest one to see the value that you get out of it back, right? I think just like this one immediately feels like, oh, hey, I search my deck, which is like an action in and of itself. I play the card which is an action, and then I get to resolve an action, which is an action, right? The tutoring effect is very powerful. You know, now, now I know why Stir the Pot's so bad, because all the other cards that Rogue has got here is so good. <laughs> Chat's giving it a four. I'm going to give this card a five. This card is very good. This card does so much. I think I'm going to give this card a five. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot my shot. Right? So like this card, you get to find, I'm assuming that you're playing a gun, right? Uh, you're going to search your deck for a gun, you're going to play that gun, and you're going to fire that gun. And then, you're going to fire that gun again and kill the enemy. Or do something else. Does it make fence playable? No, I've been... Uh, like it. Uh, like me saying everything makes gym playable, uh, like every skull card makes gym playable, and every illicit card makes fence playable, I don't think it's true anymore. Might take two years for your shot to pan out, but I think it will. I mean, Rogue is going to get a, some good guns next cycle. Like, they are. Michael McGlenn's going to be the Rogue. Michael McGlenn's going to shoot guns. And Michael McGlenn is going to go fucking nuts. Um. Yeah, this is just... There's so much power packed into this card, right? Yeah, like, you just grab one of the big rogue guns. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, like, it also firing... I I, I think... I'm gonna give this card a five. I think I'm gonna... I, I, I've been sitting on this one for a bit, and I think this one is... is as good as it seems to be. How are they gonna make Michael shoot better than Tony? I don't think they're gonna... I think Mike's... I, th I think Michael McGlynn's gonna have five fist. And I think his ability is going to be related to um, playing f illicit assets or something like that. Yeah. I think this card is just gonna... Is, um, I'm, I'm happy with 5. And like, I, like I, some people in chat are saying, yeah, it might not be a 5 right now, but it's gonna be a 5 in the future. And I think... I mean, I think even at five right now, if I get to play this to pull out a gun, play the gun, and shoot the gun, I'm happy. All right. Next up, we got the level three version of Vamp, which is a pretty neat card. I like this version. I've also been liking Vamp. I've actually been playing level zero Vamp, and I've been having an all right time with it. I gave the uh, level zero Vamp a 2.5, which honestly I think might be fair, <laughs> but I still have been enjoying it. All right. 
Uh, one cost, three experience. It's a trick parlay. Choose an enemy location and any number of skills one at a time in any order. Test each of the chosen skill two. For each test, he succeeded. If it was brain, remove one doom from that enemy. If it was book, remove, discover one clue of the enemy's location. If it was foot, automatically evade that enemy. Move it to a connected location if it's not elite. And then if it's a fist, deal two damage to that enemy. So then you can punch the enemy, evade the enemy, move it to a connected location, and then grab a clue off that location. Right? In, the, in that order. You can do that. Because that seems kind of neat. That seems kind of neat. Forgot what we were doing here, and I was like, what's this poll going on for? Chat's giving it a four. What am I going to do? This is way better. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's way better. But I don't, like, for me, I'm, I'm looking at, I, I agree with the 2.5. I don't think it's, like, I think I'm going to give it a 3.5, but I'm also kind of feeling a 3. But you know what? I'm feeling a little bit generous. I think these rogue cards are all pretty stellar so far, so I'm going to give it a 3.5. I think the effect on this is really good, right? You don't want to pass the test. You get some fine clothes in play. You're testing at zero for all of these. You throw a nimble on top of it. Also run away, right? Double wild is very good true too. That is true, but I do feel bad about committing my three experience skills. Like I know it will happen, but it always feels a little bit bad. My three, three experience cards. It's like, oh no. I bought you for the other version, but now I'm using you for this. I think Vamp's pretty sick. I'm going to give it a 3.5. Chat, you guys gave it a 4. Looking forward to your most underrated Helmock Veil vale cards uh, video and seeing Vamp 3. I don't think so. I think 3.5 is a pretty good rating for this. I, 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 I don't see this performing on the levels of cards that I personally consider a 4 or higher. So sweeping kick and one clue. It's true. It's true. It is sweeping kick plus one clue. Uh, if, but I mean, like, I think like once again, if you have, I, I, I don't see myself wanting to play this unless I'm playing fine clothes personally. So I don't think I'm underrating this card, uh, personally. I think the card's good. 3.5 is to me, a, it's a, it's a very good card. And I think Vamp's very good. I don't think Vamp's fantastic though. The remove doom certainly, yeah, it does feel, it, it, it does seem a little bit extra, but I mean like it will matter sometimes and that is kind of sick, right? I think a low level stir the pot will be underrated. Maybe. I gave it a three, which is what I would give Storm of Spirits. I think it's pretty comparable. All right. Upgraded fake credentials. Let's see. How good is this card? I think this card's pretty good. It is, but once again, it's another one of those four experience cards that are kind of just like, you're like, oh, dang, this is actually pretty fair for four experience. All right, two cost, four experience. Item Alyssa takes up the hand slot. As an action, choose an enemy or location. Parlay, test book zero. This test gets plus one difficulty for each suspicion on fake credentials. If you succeed, discover one clear location or connecting location. If you did not succeed by two or more, place one resource on fake credentials as suspicion. If you fail, return it to your hand. Um, What did I give the other one? Fake credentials, I gave a two. All right, I think I know what I'm going to rate it, but I don't want to get too deep into my conversation until we see some stuff from chat here. Uh, so I actually have had some experience now playing a Trish deck with the level zero fake credentials. And honestly, it's been popping off a little bit, but it also is very awkward. So chat, you guys are giving this one a 3.4. Okay. All right. Um, so I don't think even this version I'm looking at playing this outside of Trish Scarborough. I think in Trish, this card is good. 
I think in Trish this card is like pretty popping, but I've already been looking at the level zero fake credentials and being like, this doesn't work <laughs> like I want it to. Um, I realize I also think I'm, um, yeah, like, no, let's take that back. I don't think I misplayed. I'm not, I have to check that before I get too deep in the sauce. But I think that, um, I think that the card reads better than it actually is going to play a lot of the times. And I think the reason for this is just that um, the enemy thing is a little bit more complicated than it seems. Uh, I do agree that it can scale with the number of players, but I think that the problem is, is that like it's for experience. That's a lot of experience for an effect that I am not too interested in jumping around through the hoops for. Because in Trish, I'll kind of just be happy with a level zero, you know? Um, I'm going to give this card a 2.5. I'm not, I think it's better than the level zero version, just because like, if you're going to, if you're going to upgrade it, it's like going to be worth it if you're going to be upgrading it. Um, but I do think that it's still just a little bit too chunky for me to really want to. If this costed three experience, I'd be more into it. But at four experience, it's a little bit too much for me. So I'm going to give this a 2.5. I think the card's fine. I think any green flex wants this. If I was a green flex, I would just have a gun in one hand and my lock picks in the other, you know? That's kind of what I want to be doing. So, like, that's my issue with fake credentials for. Like, even as a flex, I don't see myself wanting this. Because what I want to do is to just get my one clue with lock picks and then kill a person. Or, like, my thieves kit. Because those are, like, a lot less experience heavy. Like, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But after playing with the level zero version, I don't see this one as too much of an improvement because all it really does is make the test easier. And in my build, the test was already easy and it wasn't too impressive for me. All right. Hey, everybody, it's stir the pot time. All right. Three costs, five experience, parlay, choose an enemy location, and test brain, uh, sorry, book X, where X is the chosen enemy's combined damage and horror values. If you succeed, deal X damage to each enemy location, and after this effect resolves, you may disengage from each enemy to, and move to a connecting location. I don't think this card is good. I think it's just too expensive. I think there's better things you can do for your experience. I think the only time I would play this card is if I was memeing or if I was doing another play all card challenge, which, I mean, I'm going to play every card in Hemlock Vale, so I'm going to play this card eventually. Um, but I don't think this card is good. If this were 1 XP, would you take it? Yeah, I would take this at 1 XP. <laughs> yeah, I would I would upgrade my Storm of Spirits. No problem. I think, like, this card actually also went down for me. Um, because of the level 0 version. I was like, this card's not good. And then the level 0 version came out. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> what happened here? But yeah, this card was 1 XP. I would take it in a heartbeat for sure. Anyways, I'm going to give it a 5, because that's how much XP it costs, and it's only fair to respect that. Okay, hear me out. I'll hear you out. Storm of Spirits is fine, right? Storm 3 does 2, 3 damage, so how much XP should Storm cost if it dealt 4 damage? This card isn't that, but honestly, uh, a Storm 5, if a, if a Storm 5 existed, it probably would deal 5 or 6 damage. So, hi, yes, hello, Russ. But I'll be honest, I actually don't even play Storm, I don't even think Storm of Spirits is that great a lot of the time. I think it's fine. I play Storm of Spirits mostly if I'm doing Dream Eaters, or if I'm, um, I know my deck's going to be bad and I need a kill spell. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, what's the XP cutoff? I mean, I would I would probably do this for two, right? I think, like, if it was, like, Storm of Spirits, if it was two, I mean, even three it would be a bit much for me, but I think three is possible. Uh, I'm going to give this card a 1.5. I think it's not, like, pure binder fodder, but I think it's, like, the XP ask is so intensive. Five experience gets you so much in Rogue, just buy a better fucking card, you know? Just buy a better card. All right. On to the uh, Mystic cards. With Mesmeric Influence. I think this card's pretty sick. I don't think it's great, but I think it's good. Uh, one experience, practice. Well, this card is committed to a skill test. The performing investigator may ignore all keyword or location effects that would trigger during this test. Um, yeah, so, like, I, I think the effect isn't, like, um, bonkers, but, I mean, in, this is, like, campaign tech, right? Like, you're bringing this in when you know your campaign is going to be doing this stuff to you, um, but it also is just, like, a guts in other cases as well. Does this need to be 1 XP? I think so. I think so. Uh, I think at 0 XP, it would, oh, hey, Russ, your little face is on camera. <laughs> I think at zero XP, it would be a little bit too good, I think. All cards put into a skill test. The performing investigator may ignore all keyword or location effects that trigger. So if you would fail a treachery test and the location would have a bad effect, if you fail the treachery, does this block that effect? That's a great question, actually. I don't know that one. Overmetal says, yep. So yes, there we go. Okay. Let's see what you guys are giving this card. I think, for me, this card just is a three. It just screams three. You guys are giving it a 3.2? I'm right there with you. I'm going to give it a three. Thank you, buddy. You want food, don't you? Yeah, there's really not much to say about it. It's just like, yeah, it, even like uh, Gurk, uh, Gurk Samples games, I agree. It's just like, it's just, this is the cost that tech cards usually are 1 XP, right? Like, Orphic Theory was 1 XP, right? Was Orphic Theory 1 XP? And I don't think Orphic Theory is bad, but it is just tech, right? Good boy. Okay. What's up next? Ah, the upgraded Olive McBride. She's pretty good. All right. Two cost, two experience. She has tried everything once. Uh, she is an ally, soaks for one and three. Has a reaction when you reveal a chaos token, exhaust all of McBride, reveal four chaos tokens instead of one. Choose two of those tokens to resolve. Ignore the rest. This is actually good for Jim. You can't, you can't, you can't get me again, uh, my addiction. You can't, I can't, I can't go back to you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the upgrade over the level zero is, like, notable. I think it's actually, like, a very, very good <laughs> improvement. Um, how good is she is the question I need to answer for myself right now. Oh, chat loves her. Chat loves the heck, the heck out of her. Chat's giving her a 4.5. I don't think I'm there. I don't think I'm going to give her a 4.5. I think I'm going to give her a 4, though. I think she is a very good card. But when I look at Olive, I don't think, like, oh, she's excellent. You know, I think she's very, very, very good. She's bordering on excellent, I think. I'm going to give her a 4. Please believe me. I do believe you. you. We just have different scales. We just have different scales. In terms of what's... A f like, that's what it comes down to. I agree. I think she's a great Blurse enabler. I think that she's, like, very good at pulling tokens. Um, but... For me, 
she's not going to win you the game by herself. And that's when I start looking at, like, fives, right? Like, when a card is, like, so good that it's going to, like, change the scope of a scenario if you draw it. And I don't think Olive McBride gets there. I think she's very good, though. I just, I just like, we have different... My fives and my 4.5s, I, I, I need to earn a bit more. They need to, like, actually get there for me. Okay. Next up, we have the level 2 version of the Rod of Karnamagos. We love Rot Wand. Alright, so this card, the upgraded version, is, is now a Lightning Bolt. Choose an only enemy at any location and exhaust Rod of Karnamagos. Reveals 5 random Chaos Tokens in the Chaos Bag. For each Curse Token revealed, you may search your bonding cards for a Rot event and attach it to that enemy. The Rot events attach to that enemy. When the enemy dies, they leave and they all have a negative effect or positive effect for you on that enemy. Enemy cannot move on Virescent Rot. Scarlet Rot, they take 1 damage at the end of each round, so otherwise known as Grievous Wound. Uh, Putrescent Rot, they get minus 1 fight, minus 1 evade. Uh, Abyssal Rot, the enemy cannot attack. And Amber Rot, when attached to enemy is defeated, gain resources equal to its printed health to a maximum of 5. Can you only use Rot once per scenario? No, you can use each Rot multiple times. That's how I read it. Is Ursula alive now? I mean, I, that, I'm not the person to ask. I'm not the person to ask because um, Travis and Bryn are the one that Ursula is dead for. Holy shit, Russ. The rating from chat, 4.9. Wow, chat. Holy hell. That's insane. So I think uh, mechanically, I love the design of this card. I think they do chaos magic in a way. Well, it's not this one's not chaos magic, but the whole rod of Karnamagos, the idea of chaos magic, I think is really well handled in the design of this card. Um, I do think that if you can use this to cheese stuff like Song of the Dead, um, Song of the Dead, stuff like, um, Sixth Sense, the, uh, the Eye of Chaos, the Armageddon, stuff like that, this obviously goes up in value, right? I love that you can cast the spell from anywhere. That's really sick. Um... I gave the original Rod of Karnamagos a 3.5, and I think this is just a better version of the card. Um, I'm waiting to see if they... That's my cat. I'm waiting to see if they tweak this card to not be able to work in the way that we think it is, you know? Um... I think the card's I think the card's very good. It's just the question of how good is it actually and how much of it is it actually just kind of a meme, you know? Does it count as reveal in the test? Right now, yes. Right now, as written, it does count as reveal during the test. But we're waiting to see if that's actually a thing because it actually has like cascading effects on a large variety of the mystic cards. I think personally they should just leave it for a bit, let people have fun with it, let people who break the game with it break the game with it and be like, that's boring, I don't want to do that anymore, you know, and then they can go from there. Hi, Russ. Yeah, I was making fun of people who just always break the game and then complain about it as if, you know, like it was their fault that they broke the game. It wasn't their fault that they broke the game. This isn't a test though, but you can do it as a, as a lightning bolt during the skill test. Right? So you initiate your Song of the Dead. You then um, Lightning Bolt during the skill test window to do Rod Ghost. You have a Skull revealed, and a Scar was revealed during this skill test. What are the things that this breaks? Uh, I think it breaks Sixth Sense most notably. I think the synergy with the Armageddon and Eye of Chaos is actually a positive. I think that's actually a good thing. 
Uh, I like it with Song of the Dead just because, like, you can live the meme and have a good time with it. Um, but I do think that ultimately they're going to rule against it. But I like it with the curse spells. I actually kind of like it with the curse spells a lot. Um, I'm going to give Rodicarnamagos, taking the cheese out of it, I'm going to give Rodicarnamagos 2 of 4. Just taking all the cheese out. I'm going to just take the cheese out. Because I think with the cheese it's a 4.5, but I think without the cheese it's a 4. I think it's a good card. You get the right thing on an enemy, and you don't need to worry about it. Russ, do you want food? Is that why you're down here? Do I need to go feed you? Hi, buddy. <sighs> okay. I would be happy if they printed a card dedicated to the gimmick of revealing a bunch of tokens during those tests. I just don't know if Rod should be warped into that card. I can agree with that sentiment. I can agree with that. If, like, that was the card's design and you had, like, a few charges, you know? It's, like, reveal three additional tokens. Yeah. I think that could be fun. Just It just says reveal three tokens from the bag. Let's go! If a symbol token is revealed, gain a resource. You know, something like that. I think that could be fun. Or, like, gain a resource or draw a card. Now we're cooking. All right. All right. Next up, we got Call the Beyond. I'll be honest, I've tuned out a lot of these Mystic cards. Is this the Recharge one? Is this new Recharge? Recharge, but with, like, new paint? Zero cost event, two experience, ritual curse, additional cost to play Call the Beyond, add three curse tokens to the chaos bag, choose an asset you control with uses charges or uses secrets, replenish all of that asset's charges or secrets, then you may resolve an action ability or lightning ability on the card without paying its cost if any. Holy fuck, this card's really good. <laughs> Holy shit, this card's fantastic. What the fuck? Yeah, this card's really good, right? This card's, like, very good. Yeah, and also because it is uh, level 2, there's going to be a lot of cross synergy with, like, Daisy and the Mystics. Daisy and her Mystic Splash. This is a good card. I like this card a lot, actually. Oops. Chad, you guys are giving it a 3.8. Yeah, like it also, like this card is not actually fast. But it is kind of fast. It does provoke attacks of opportunity, so like using it for combat is a little bit less exciting. But this card is kind of like fast. I think I'm going to give this card a 4. I think this card's really good. I think this card's going to see play in a lot of Mystic decks. It's going to see play in a lot of Mystic decks, I think. Like, I just fucking refill my Brandica Thug of 4. Oh my god. Or even, you know what? I'm happy to just refill my Divination. <laughs> You know what? I'm even fucking happy to refill, like, a Spirit of Humanity if need be, if the group needs some support. A Shriveling. And we haven't even got to talk about the secret stuff. Yeah, being able to get the action means that even, like, a Runic Axe, it doesn't feel terrible. That's very true, Holy Helicopter. I think that's very true. For 2 XP, you're basically another copy of 4 or 5 XP spell. It's true. And then also, like, I mean, like, I also think, like, the upgraded, um... Ah! You know, the lady, she's going like this. Why does, why does the, my, why does that, it's, uh... I have to, like, read the signs in my head, but that's just because the card's coming up next. You know, the one that lets you play an asset? Uncage the Soul. Yes, Uncage the Soul. Yes. Yeah, and I think Uncage the Soul upgrade is also incredibly playable, and this is just basically, like, another version of that in your deck. I love it. I think this card's really good. All right, hey, I'm here too. I'm here too, guys. Uh, ethereal form. Two. Evade. 
two cost. Add your brain. Okay, so this is basically the originals, but now they can return to your hand if a symbol was revealed. So this one is add your brain to your skill value for this evasion type. If you succeed, disengage from each other enemy, engage with you for the remainder of the round. You are ethereal. You turn into a ghost. Enemies can't engage you or be engaged with you, and you cannot attack or deal damage to enemies. If a symbol was revealed during this evasion attempt, return ethereal form to your hand at the end of your turn. I'm sorry, ethereal form, but you're still not good enough. I just don't think evading is where you want to be. Can you use with the rod? That is true. You can use with the rod. I don't think ethereal form... I'm going to give this a 2.5. I just don't like evading. And I don't think evading is worth it for a lot of times. And the effect on this, I don't think, is really enough to make it really worthwhile. I don't think it's a 2, though. I personally, for me, don't think it's a 2. Chat's going to give it a 2.1. I mean, I think Ethereal Form is still playable, and I think the upgraded version is also still, um... Is also still there. So I'm gonna give it a 2.5. I could see me dropping this in the future, but I think just Ethereal Form is just a fine card. I don't like it. Alright. Next up, we're gonna keep this going with the upgraded Read the Signs. Uh, two cost event, two experience, investigate, add your brain value, your skill value for this investigation. You may ignore any effect or keyword on your on your location that would trigger during this investigation. If you succeed, discover an additional clue at this location. If a symbol was revealed during this investigation, return, read the signs to your hand at the end of your turn. Uh, can I be real? I don't think that these are actually necessary. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't see myself buying these in a lot of my decks. I'm going to buy them in like scenario eight, unless I was a spell slinger, right? Um, and I think that, like, while these upgrades are cool, and I think they're good, I actually, like, unless I'm planning on building around them to, like, bring them back to my hand a lot, specifically in Parallel Agnes, I'm actually not that intrigued by these upgrades. Because, yeah, the level zero is just good enough. Russ, are you ready to back down here for food? Back down, come, come here. If you want attention, just come up here. Uh, da, 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 da. you guys have given it a 3.9. Uh, I'm going to give it a 3.5 because, I mean, read the signs is still a good card, right? Uh, I, I, funnily enough, though, I think actually the level zero versions I'd rate higher. Look, this this cat wants so much attention right now. Hello. You need to come stick your head on camera, huh? I'm gonna give it a three point five. And spoiler alert, it's probably gonna be similar for Spectral Razor. But I would give the level zero version of these actually a four. Yeah, I give him a treat. This is what I, I usually give him a treat around noon. Russ, I haven't even eaten yet today, and you're complaining about being hungry, you punk. Upgraded Spectral Razor. Honestly, copy-paste with a lot of what I said about the first one. So this one is a two-cost event, two-experience fight. Add your brain value or skill value for this attack. Immediately before this attack, you may engage the attacked enemy. This attack deals plus one damage, plus two instead if it was the enemy is non-elite. If a symbol was revealed during this attack, return Spectral Razor to your hand at the end of your turn. Um... I'm gonna, I think this card's still, I think the card, like, it's still Spectral Razor, but I am gonna give it a 3.5 again. Um, just because I do think that the level 0 versions are just better. I mean, like, you're doing this with, um, the Key of Solomon, right? So that's, like, part of your economy. Like, there's a package that you can do, right? Um to get there but it's like a, it's like a big combo piece at that point then you're like doing a lot of synergy within your deck um i don't think the card's bad i don't think the card's bad um because how can it be it's still spectral razor but it is notably i think worse than read the signs you guys gave it a 3.6 
Yeah, or prophetic. Yeah, or pro prophetic will also get you there. I mean, I think you can do it. I just think the question is like, unless you're like spell slinging, you don't really need to, right? So the question is why, unless you're really doing it. Okay, so this card is interesting. Do I think it's good? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's read into this. Ethereal Weaving. One cost, three experience. Spirit in a double. As additional cost to play Ethereal Weaving, spend an action. Reveal up to three different spell events from your hand, one at a time. Play each revealed event, reducing its cost by one. While resolving each of these events, you get plus two skill value. Do you... Okay, so here's a question. <laughs> here's a question. When you... Because you're revealing the events... Are you actually playing them from the hand? Or are you just casting them for, like, paying for them? But then they go back into your hand after being revealed. Because that would really change the level of this card, right? Because it's weird that you have to reveal them. As opposed to just, like, it would just say one at a time, play, um, play events. Right? Sounds like you're playing them, and then why am I revealing them? Is my question to respond to your, your point. Then why am I revealing them? Two point six from you guys, which I think is pretty fair to be honest. No, I, I understand it says play. But why am I revealing them if I'm playing them? That's why I'm thinking maybe the intention is that you actually get them for free. Like, you don't get them for free, but they don't count as cat, like, played. Uh, that makes sense. So you can't draw a new one. So you basically have to lock in before you start going. That does make sense. That, that, that's a... That's, uh... Yeah, look, Russ, you fell because you were rolling around on a small thing up there. Thinking there's a playground, but no, this is my office, buddy. Because you decide which spells before you have to... Yeah, don't bite me, you fucking jerk. Don't do that. Don't bite me. Hey. Come here. Come here. Come sit with me. I'm gonna spank your little bottom. Hi. Yeah, that makes sense. So you, you have to commit before you actually do it. Yeah, Russ just delved too deep. Good boy. Hey, buddy. Yeah, I think that checks out. I think it's a bit clunky. Like, I think this card actually would be worth the XP if you didn't actually have to play the event, right? Like, if you, if you played it, but it didn't count as being played. But assuming because it doesn't they have to lock in, it doesn't say anything about going to your hand, the card's pretty not great. I think it's good in Agnes, right? Like, Parallel Agnes, rather. Like, in Parallel, Parallel Agnes, I think this has a home. But I'm not rating for the best case scenario. I think I'm going to give this card a 2. But I think in Parallel Agnes, this card's really sweet. Yeah, it needs to be three different cards, too. I think I'm going to give it a 2. Good boy. Okay. Yes. You still have to pay the other action, I believe. Alright, Key of Solomon. This card's pretty sick. Two cost, four experience. Secrets of the Unknown. Uh, takes up the hand slot. Item, tome, bless, cursed. Does a lightning bolt. If there are more blessed than cursed tokens in the chaos bag, remove one blessed token in the chaos bag and exhaust the Key of Solomon. Heal up to two damage and or horror from an investigator or ally asset at your location. Lightning bolt. If there are more cursed than blessed tokens in the chaos bag, remove one blessed token in the chaos bag and exhaust the Key of Solomon. Gain two resources. Wow, Jesus Christ, Russ. Good God. Just scratched my hand up something good. Ouchie. Hey, go away. Go away, buddy. Um. Oh, God, yeah, he got me. Jesus, ouchie. Um. I think this card's very good. I think this card's very good. I don't think it'll be great. I think it's great. I don't think how this card can't be, like, good if you're in a Blessed Curse deck. So I need to grab some paper towel. Well, I'm going to pause the video. <laughs> Owie! Alright, so, uh, 
Chad gave this card a 4.1 with their average. Um, but I think um, in uh, Curse Bless deck, this card is its just value, right? It's just value on top of it. Um, I don't care about the healing that much. I'm looking at this as just the economy side of it, right? Like, I'm looking at, like, you're playing a Curse deck, you play Kia Solomon, you commit your Promise of Power, and then you turn your Promise of Power into... Uh, <laughs> Uh, basically like a, a cryptic writing or whatever that one card is that gives you two resources. Um, and I think like that's... Like the blessed stuff's nice, but I think that like the... Um, the curse token to turn... Anytime you play one of these cards that put curses in into economy on top of it, I think is really nice. Uh, I'm going to give this card a 3.5. I don't think it's going to like be like a mover or shaker or change like the meta and anything. But I think in the right deck, this card is going to actually pop off and do some good good shit. It's also really easy to find. It, like, like this is also, you play this in like a, a, a Seeker, like a, like a Luke Robinson, for example, right? Or like a... Don't make me say Jim Culver. But basically, if you have access to... Um, if you have access to Research Librarian, this card becomes, like, practically free to find, right? It is also, yeah, it is very strong healing. It's very strong healing. Yeah, I'm going to give this kind of 3.5. Okay, next up, we have Seal of the Elders. Jesus, Russ, you got me so good. Holy hell. That really hurt, buddy. Okay. Seal of the Elders, 5 experience, 0 cost. Spell packed, packed, blessed, cursed, fast. Play after skill to your location ends in which at least 2 cursed or 2 blessed tokens are revealed. If 2 cursed tokens are revealed, search your bonded cards for 1 copy of Servant of Brass put into play. If 2 blessed tokens are revealed... Uh, search your bonded cards for Keeper of the Key and put into play. If two Curse and Bless tokens are revealed, do both instead and remove Seal of the Elders from the game. Keeper of the Key, Bonded, Seal of the Elders, they both are. They One soaks for four brain, one soaks for four meat. Uh, when a Bless token is revealed during a skill to your location, discover, uh, deal a whore to Keeper of the Key and discover one clear location or connecting location. When Keeper of the Key would leave play, set it aside out of play. Servant of Brass, when a Curse token is revealed at your location, Deal one damage to uh, it and two damage to an enemy location or connecting location. Lots of hoops. Yeah, I think this card is more fun than it is actually, like, really good. And that's kind of where I am with this card. Chat's given it a 3.8. Okay, how good... Like, what's my prediction for this card? Is this card actually good? Like, what's the rating I would actually give this card? Hmm. Blurst decks are stapled together with hopes and prayers. I agree. I mean, I agree. I think Ohaku is going to change that a little bit. I think Ohaku is going to be pretty consistent at Blurst decks because of his signature. Which I'm pretty sure is a tome, right? I don't think this card's that good. I'm gonna give this card a... Pfft. I want to give this card like a 2. I think this card's cool as hell, but I don't think it's good. I think I'm gonna give it a... Maybe a 2.5. Like, the thing is, if you're like a blessed deck, you could just play this. And like, be happy with it. But like, the blurs part, I think you, that's a pipe dream. Yeah, I think I'm going to give this card a 2. That's what my gut's telling me, and that's what I'm going to give it. And maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe in a year we'll look back and be like, wow, what the hell was Justin smoking? This card has broken the game wide over, and they had to taboo it to be forbidden. How about this for a minimum case? 5 XP, 0 resources, fast 4 clues. We just assume we draw enough blesses for that to happen. Assuming we don't get to choose where the clues come from. I think it's a bit too slow. Kind of just like passive drip clues is probably not worth it, right? B 
because you can just like do that you can just probably win the game quicker with less experience i think that's a good thought process to try to put it into a perspective but i think ultimately with that thought process i think even then it's not worth it right i like that though i, I think that's a good way to approach it but i think ultimately i think like you want control over your cards like control is what makes you win arkham if you're able to control what you're doing hi how you doing Are you no longer mad at me? Now you scratch me? Are we, are we back to being friends, buddy? Alright, let's go on to Survivor. The Hatchet. Yes, I also think the card's really fun and I'm excited to play with it. But sometimes we gotta, like, the cards that we love might just not be good. And we have to just, like, you know, accept it, but still love playing them. I'm pointing at Jim Culver right now. Alright. Um, two cost, one experience. Takes up the hand slot. Item tool, weapon range. Does an action fight. Add your foot to your skill value with this attack. This attack deals plus one damage. If this attack defeats an enemy, discard hatchet. Otherwise, lose control of hatchet and attach it to the attacked enemy. Attached enemy gains as a reaction. When attached, when attached enemy is defeated, take control of Hatchet. Any investigator at Hatchet's location may trigger this ability. I think this is actually a very powerful weapon. Uh, it's just a little bit, you can't just like, you can't just like swing the hammer with this card. You need to, um, you definitely need to like think a little bit and like sequence your turns in a way to best take advantage of the Hatchet, you know? This card's been like a psychic virus plaguing me how to make it work in a deck. Yeah, you just just put it in the deck and attack with it. <laughs> that's my thought. That's, that, that's my advice. Survivors in their very design are designed to be scrappy, right? That's why their signature of from Dunwich is called Scrapper, right? Like they're they're permanent. Um, chat's giving it a 3.1. Uh, but survivor weapons are like a little bit funkier. And this is like a, a level one weapon that's going to do a lot of work. Uh, it's like your weapon that you're using in addition. Like the boost it's going to give you in a lot of fighters is really insane. Uh, I think that, I mean, this is like the first time, like I, I know all the classes, but like survivor is like my class where it's like my class, right? The one where I can do the most theory crafting in because I have the most knowledge of the general card pool and how they play. And I think Hatchet's going to overperform what people are thinking. And I think a lot of people are going to just like try to use Hatchet as their weapon, which is incorrect, right? Hatchet is your um, kill spell or alternatively your setup weapon or you're running other things to help fight with it as well. And you're kind of just like scrappy and throwing stuff together. Um... I'm going to give this card a 3.5. I don't think it's, like, fantastic, but I think it is a good weapon. So I'm going to give this card a 3.5. I think it's a good weapon. I think it's going to it's gonna do... It's going to bring the noise. It's going to bring the noise for sure. All right. Next up... We have... Persistence. Otherwise known as Hank Sampson. Uh, Till in a field. This is a level one skill. It's innate, commits for a wild. You may commit persistence to a skill test from your discard pile. If you do, shuffle into your deck after this test ends. So this is probably the most Justin card that has ever existed. This is like me. This is me in a card. This is like what I like in games. Just like value on value that is just like, it's not great, but it's good. And it gets there. However, with all that said, I don't think this card is particularly playable outside of a few examples. I would play this card in Silas. I would play this card in Min. And um, yeah, if Winnie could take it, she would love it. Uh, but the reality is that I think it's not that usable outside of those places. But I think the card, just on its own, is fine. And I think it is particularly playable. Uh, so I'm going to be giving this card a 2.5 for me personally. For one XP, let me cut this unexpected curve in half. I mean, we do have the um, 
uh, Solomon. Isn't he the king that cut the thing in down the middle? Right? So it makes sense. It's only fitting. Chat gave this one a four. I support it, chat. Maybe I'm out to lunch on this one. Maybe I'm out to lunch. I think the problem is, though, is that you don't really want to draw this card. So, like, maybe the earworm is going to um, want to play forced learning with this card. Because <clears throat> you don't want to draw this card unless... But, I mean, like, once again, I'm happy to draw this in Silas and Min. <laughs> Otherwise, not so much. I love it in Silas and Min. Problem is, though, is that... Excuse me, Silas's skill suite is getting really good and his deck is getting very packed. So it's hard to find new cards for it. I think it's interesting for Wendy, avoiding her deck reshuffling. That's really neat. I think that's pretty cool. Just like, uh, I never want to stop. I never want to get off this ride. I think that's kind of cool. That's some cool tech. I think that's pretty sweet. All right, on to Devil, a card that I feel like has been with us forever. <laughs> But I've yet to play it. <clears throat> um, Devil. One cost, two experience. Black Phillip takes up the ally slot, soaks through three damage, ally creature cursed. When your turn begins, move one damage from your investigator to Devil. And when Devil is defeated, he'll do deal two damage to each enemy and an investigator at your location. This card is five out of five goaded. It is goaded. A hundred percent. I think it's a good card, right? I don't think it's bad. I think it has its homes. I think in it, just on its own, I was going to say in and of itself again, but on its own, um, I think it, it like it brings the noise. I don't think it's particularly great. Excuse me. I don't think it's particularly great. But I think the card is actually good. I think I'm going to give it a three. I think I like a three for for the goat. That is a 3.3 from you guys, which I think is completely fair. Yeah, no, this, this card, I mean, like, it, it wouldn't work anywhere else except Survivors, you know? Diamond Glass is instantaneous. This is already hard to use. Adding a timer to it is weird. Also, Ally Slot. I can't. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't. They're different. They're very different. They're very different. This costs one. It, like, uh, it costs one. <laughs> and you also can, like, soak it in other places really easily while this guy's also healing you, right? Like, this guy's going to heal you three damage. You put the damage that this guy's on on something else. It's a lot different. Like, the damage is nice, but the damage is, like, I think just, like, part of this full package. Well, Dynamite Blast only does damage and also costs five more. <sighs> That's just my thought. I just, like, it's, it's, this isn't a, it's like a Dynamite Blast, but if we're looking at the evaluation of a card, it, this is not, it can't be critiqued on the same level of Dynamite Blast because it's very different. Anyway, anyway, what's next? Fire Axe! Oh, no. Oh no, my, look at what they did to my boy. They made it cost so much, it'll only be somewhat slightly better. All right. Uh, one cost, two experience. Commits for two fist, which I think is different. Takes up a hand slot fast as an action fight. If you have no resources in your resource pool, this attack deals plus one damage. Um, lightning bolt during the attack using fire axe. Spend one resource, you get plus two fist for this attack. Limit three times per attack. I mean, like, to what you're saying, Astute, it is true. Like, it's a shame that Hank didn't get, like, another cool new weapon on top of this. However, both Pitchfork and Hatchet are two really cool weapons that I think are going to be really fun to play with. 
Um, it's still a good card, right? Like, Fire Axe is still a good, very playable weapon. And upgraded Fire Axe is not going to be too much different compared to that. Um, it's really easy to get good advantage out of this card. The fast is... is, I just wish there was, like, you know... It just feels a bit much. It just feels a bit much for what you're getting out of it. Um, but once again, you're also Survivor, right? So, like, you're pretty happy to work with pretty low stuff chat's giving it a three what am i giving this what would i give regular fire axe as a weapon probably like a three right i think it's a good weapon but i don't think it's like great I mean, I think it's pretty comparable, right? Fire X Zero is five for you. Limit four times per attack. I think limit four times per attack also could have been, you know, an another thing on top of it just to give it a bit more juice, right? I think I'm gonna give it a three because I think I think it's pretty comparable to the level zero Fire Axe, which is also a three for me. I don't think this card's worse. I think it's just different. It's just an extension of it. As opposed to, like, um, when I look at the spectral, the spectral Razor and read the signs, I don't see a reason to upgrade. I can see a reason for me eventually upgrading into this. But the card doesn't get bad just because, of, uh, just with this upgrade. It's just, like, it's just a little bit boring. It's just a little bit boring is all. All right. Next up, we got a really interesting card. I think this card's pretty sick. I think this card's pretty cool. Hunting Jacket. Two cost, two experience. It's an asset. Uh, takes up the body slot as, an, as a lightning bolt. Exhaust Hunting Jacket. Choose one non minus card in your hand and attach it face down to Hunting Jacket. Max three cards attached. Then, gain one resource for each attached card. As a reaction, when a uh, Hunting Jacket is defeated, draw each attached card. I think this card's pretty good. I think this card's actually, like, quite playable, and I think a lot of survivors are just going to run this card. It kind of reminds me of Professor, um... Uh, Armitage from Dunwich, the signature asset. Yeah, so I think that it, uh, with the ruling that they have on Diana, you actually can just keep going at three, which I imagine they're going to walk back that ruling on Diana, maybe. <laughs> because it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit much just to be able to get an emergency cash every turn. If, as, as on demand. Just giving a 4.1. That's a nice score. Yeah, and uh, the flavor, I don't care, man. Some cards just don't have flavor, and they're just good to play. They're not for you, the flavor heads out there. They're just for the function heads out there. And we function heads, we love it. The people who see, like, uh, Gabriel Carrillo or whatever the care ally's name is, like, that's Kohaku's partner. They're the people who look at Hunting in a Hat Jacket and be like, what the heck is this? And you know what? That's okay. Gabriel has that lore thing for you, Hunting Jacket. It just looks good and gives me resources, baby, you know? Um, I think it's good. I think it's going to be played... Uh, I think a lot of survivors can just slot this in. I think, like, a lot of survivors who play leather... Um, the leather coat or whatever it is are going to just, like, be able to just eventually upgrade into this. The soak is wild. Uh, it's just a good card. I'm going to give this a 3.5. I think it's a very good card. All right. Mariner's Compass. I think this upgrade is actually a more exciting than the Fire Axe one, so that is sick. 
Chad, let's be the There's no way it gives three fast resources. It does, following the rules. <laughs> it does follow in with the rules they made, actually. It does do that. Uh, Mariner's Compass. Two cost, two experience. Takes up the hand slot. Uh, item tool, action, exhaust Mariner's Compass. Investigate. If you fail, ready Mariner's Compass. If you succeed and have no resources in your resource pool, discover one additional clue at your location. Um, this is the new text is the ready on that one. It also costs one less, which I think is also a notable change. Uh, Lightning Bolt, during your investigation, using Mariner's Compass, spend one resource, you get plus one book for the skill test, limit three times per investigation. Um, yeah, I think it's good. Uh, what would I give regular Mariner's Compass? Probably also a three, right? I think Mariner's Compass zero is a good card. Is this a 3.5 in comparison? Or is it still a three? That's a great question. Four, five, six, two. Chat's giving it a 3.8. Like the fail clause is nice. The problem is though, is like, why would I want to ready this and try again when I spent all my resources on the first one, you know? I think I'm also going to give this a three. I don't think it's going to move the needle too much. What did your Flex Silas investigate with? Uh, I don't even remember. You have me curious. Now I want to check. I'm actually am curious what he used to investigate with. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's kind of like where I am too, right? Um... Because, yeah, you, you put all your stuff into your first investigate, and now you failed that test. So, like, how are you going to pass that second investigate? With other combo pieces? Like, like you have, like, the some of the freaking... Um, what's it? <laughs> what am I trying to say? Like, the, the three um, the three class cards. I'm trying to upgrade to see this Silas deck that I was playing. Uh, I think, I mean, but I mean, like, I like it for the resource reduction. I think the resource reduction is really nice. Because while you can do the Dark Horse 5 and get the upgrade on that, the level the level 0 version works really well with this Mariner's Compass to play them both. I'm going to give this a 3, though. I think it's still just a 3. What if you're like Daryl with 5? That's fine. It's fine. Once again, I think it's like that that would be the use case for it, but I don't think it's I don't think it's uh I think also Daryl just I'd rather run a magnifying glass. Okay. Let's check out this Silas deck. What did I flex with? I don't because I don't maybe I had a one of Mariner's Compass, or maybe a two of. But I don't think I was a Dark Horse deck. I think I was an Ancient Covenant deck with I was probably doing Favor of the Sun. Arkham DB is taking forever to load, so. Remind me to check at the end of the scenario. We're going to keep moving. We're going to go on to survival techniques. This is a cool card. Is it good? Let's find out. Two cost, two experience. Uh, talent science. Choose a card you own that is attached to your location. Exhaust survival technique is a lightning bolt. Add that card to your hand. That's pretty cool. As a lightning bolt during a skill test on a location or on a treachery attached to location, exhaust survival technique, get plus two skill value for this test. So... Um, this actually works for basic investigates because a skill test on a location is a basic investigate action, but you don't get to use it for stuff that's like bold investigate. Um, I think this card's really cool. I think it's a fun build around. Do I think it's powerful? No, but I think it's good. I think I'm going to give it a 3.5. I think it's notably powerful enough that the effect like when it, in its full like in its full glory it's going to be good and i think this is a card that is only likely to get like it's going to like get finer with age it's going to get stronger and be able to do more exciting things so i'm going to give this card a 3.5 and chat is going to give it a 3.9 you love to see it You love to see it. Okay, we have four survivor cards left. So we have seven cards left to go. We are nearing the end of the video, and honestly, while it wasn't three hours, it is pretty close.
Does it really work on basic investigates? That's what I've read online. Yes, that is what I've read online, because it is a basic investigate. You're investigating, um, it's a test on a location. We can go to the rules, and we can even go a bit deeper. Oh, everything's loaded now. Right, let's see the Silas deck as well. All right, let's just look up investigate. It already has the FAQ for this point. Oh, even better! Let's check out the FAQ! Look at that! <clears throat> yes, investigation tests counts as a skill test on a location for survival technique. Ooh, that's a great question. Does that mean true understanding? Uh, no, it would not. I don't think it does, actually. I don't think it would actually. So, because true understanding is commit only to a skill test from an ability printed on a scenario card. True scenario act true understanding actually says printed. A basic investigate action is not a test printed on a scenario card. So, I think that all makes sense. It all checks out. All right. Yes, I too had, did have two Mariner's Compass in that deck. All right. Next up, we got Keep Faith 2. Upgraded Keep Faith, uh, zero cost event. Fast, play during the Lightning Bolt window, add four Blessed Stones to the Chaos Bag. It is only basic investigates, yes. Yeah, it is only basic investigates because other investigates are on like things, they're on like items, right? Exactly with that fingerprint kit. Because, yeah, you're investigating with the action on fingerprint. It's no longer... Well, it is still a basic action. But it's, it's an investigate action. It's a basic action on a location. On a card versus uh, basic investigate action on a location. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, like, this upgrade's fine. But I don't think it's particularly impressive. Um, like, you can do... It's cheaper, which is nice. But, like, the real secret tech is just play that new fucking... Um, accessory slot that goes nuts um it's nice to upgrade to but i don't think it's like an upgrade you need to rush towards <clears throat> yeah i agree it being zero is a really nice upgrade for it because zero x like if it was three and reduced to one that would be a lot different than it being two and reducing to zero no one wants to rate the survivor cards. Everyone's leaving. <laughs> you five people are deciding all these cards for next year. So more power to you. Ah, you guys are giving it a 3.2. I'm going to agree. I'm going to give it a 3.0. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good card. Eon Chart did allow... If you're playing without the taboo list, yes. Eon Chart allows you to use it... Uh, other actions... You could, like, use it to use a, a lockpicks, for example. But it was tabooed to be basic. Okay. Uh, next up, we got Providential. Is that how you pronounce this card? I never really, like, said this word before this. Um... Two experience, skill, innate, blessed. If the skill test is commits for a brain, a wild, and a fist. If the skill test is successful, add one token, uh, blessed token to the cast bag for each damage or horror on you, whichever is less. Hmm. I'll play this card in Silas. I'll give it a shot in Silas, right? I think I like it in Silas. Like, in specifically blessed Silas. I think it's pretty nice. Is it good, though? Like, also, like, Breast, uh, Breast, Blessed, uh, Kelvin is another interesting home for it. It's bad if one of them are zero. That is true. It's very bad if one of them are zero. I think this card is, um... I think this card is kind of clunky. I think there's going to be homes for it. But, like, actually looking at the card right now, 
I think it's going to be clunkier than it is actually going to be, like, consistent. I, I like the homes for it. I, I think there is some definitely some good homes for the card. But I think that it's not really worth it for a lot of cases. Chat, you guys gave it a 2.3. I'm going to give it a 2. Alright, next up. We got Token of Faith 3. I love Token of Faith 0, so let's see how this guy is. Now you might be saying, but Justin, you already talked about these cards. Yeah, but I forget about them. I like vaguely know what they do. So I'm even revisiting them for myself right now. Token of Faith. Two cost, three experience. Takes the accessory slot. Item charm blessed. As a reaction after skill test ends in which one or more curse tokens or auto fail tokens are revealed. Exhaust token of faith. Add that many blessed tokens to the chaos bag. If this skill test failed, after resolving all effects on the failed test, perform an investigate may attempt that test again. This is a good card. I think it's good. What would I give it? Like, you need to fail the test. So the difference is you need to fail the test, which always happens with the auto-fail, or uh, he's have a curse token reveal. Well, it's a curse token revealed and fail the test for the curse tokens, which honestly actually doesn't happen too much unless, like, someone's going heavy hard on curses. So what are we going to give it? Let's see what chat gives it. Chat's giving it a 4.7. And my ass over here, I was probably going to give this a 3. <laughs> okay, I need to... Uh, let's, let's check this card out again. Let's, let's give it, like, a good look. Because a 4.7 is really high, and I just need to see if I'm crazy. Because my gut was saying three for this card. I think it's good, but I don't know if it's particularly great. Two cost, three experience. After skill test ends, which one or more cursed or one of uh, cursed tokens were revealed, or auto fails were revealed, exhaust token of faith. Add that many blessed tokens cast back. So that's just basic token of faith. Add that many blood. Uh, if this test skill has failed, after resolving all effects on the fail test, perform an investigator may attempt that test again. Uh, yeah, I don't see it. I think it's good. I think it's a good card. Using the power to save any test once per round is too good of an effect. That is true. It is a good effect. But it is expensive on XP. Yeah, that's kind of like what I'm looking at, right? Like, if you're not playing Nightmare Bobble, this is, like, kind of, like, in the same sort of design space for me. It is anyone, though, right? It's anyone anywhere, which is notable. To be honest, I still kind of like it more for the Blessed Token generation. Just, like, turning those Cursed Tokens. But the problem is, like... Yeah, like, it, there's going to be times where, like, you do the auto-fail and it's like you get, like, a a bad version of Father Mateo, right? If you get it, like, three times a game, that's kind of sick. You get another shot at it. I think, I think I'm going to give it a 3.5. I think, yeah, the, the point that it's just, like, just auto-fail protection is probably reason enough that it's, like, worth it. But I don't think it's a 4 for me personally. I'm going to give it a 3.5. I think it's a cool card. I think it's like I think it's a good card. I think, it, I think it's good. Um, but I'm going to give this a 3.5, I think. 
So you load up Rougarou with some patrons, you draw some 5 minus 5, hey, look at this, and you go, fuck, I mean, well, I'm not probably playing this unless I'm playing Cursed Staff Tokens, am I? <laughs> I'm not just bringing this randomly, right? Like, I'm, I'm looking at this if someone's like, if someone's playing Cursed Tokens, I'll, I'll play this. If someone in my group is not playing, I'm not, I'm not doing this just to protect from the autofail. My, my cards are worth more than to protect the game from three autofails, right? Uh, this is like, I'm only including this if someone's playing Curse, and I'm only gonna, like, consider it for that. I'm not playing this just for the autofail cancelling. <clears throat> autofail tokens do la matter less than people generally think. I think that's what the thing is. Like, autofill tokens do matter less than people actually weight them as. And I think that's why I'm not viewing this as just for that as power on its own. Because autofill tokens, they suck. But I have won a lot of scenarios through autofill tokens, and I don't need to kind of, like, mitigate them and spend time doing that for the most part. If someone was playing Curse, yeah, I'll do that. Not so much otherwise. All right, upgraded Dark Horse. <clears throat> Five experience, this motherfucker now be a permanent. Limit one per uh, per deck. How much do you rate Seal of the Seven Sign, Justin? What's that one? Is that that fucking... Um, one where you get rid of the autofail? I'd probably give that a three. <laughs> I'd probably give that card a three. That's the one where you lock away the autofail, right? Yeah, I would give that a three probably. I think that card's fine. It's good. Uh, upgraded Dark Horse. Upgraded Dark Horse. It is nice in your Survivor deck to just, like, if you're playing Dark Horse, to just always have that active. Um, so, like, how can this be bad, right? However, uh, with all that said, on top of that, I don't think Dark Horse is a good archetype. So I don't know if it being permanent is good enough for me to think that this card is super playable, you know? Don't worry that Dark Horse is, uh, is cost of three resources. That's a positive, I think, on a lot of times. I actually like that it costs three resources. It got me to my zero quicker. Chad, you're giving it a 3.9. What am I going to give this? Yeah, I do agree. I think that this is a nice one to make a permanent. And mostly, it's mostly just because the power level of Dark Horse is actually pretty low, right? Like, when I first started playing, I loved Dark Horse decks. That's just because I love stats. But then I realized, now, in Arkham, there are much better ways to make your, um... Uh, much better ways to make your stat, like, to, to make your stats higher. But the question is, now that it's permanent, are sometimes people just gonna run this card? Uh, and just if they have ways to spend their resources and get value on top of it. And that's a question that I actually need to consider, right? Like, are people just going to be playing this card just for the use cases where eventually maybe they'll get the bonuses out of it? I'm going to give it a 3.5, I think. I think it's still, I think it's good. Um, I, I'd give Dark Horse a 3, maybe a 2.75. So I think I'll give Dark Horse 5 a 3.5. Right? I think it's probably incorrect to just put this in any deck. Um, but you definitely could. You definitely could. Alright, chat. We have three cards left. We are into our neutrals. Dude, this is going to be like almost three hours long. That's crazy. Alright. Dawn Star. Star. 
One cost, one experience, event, ritual blessed, fast, play after revealing chaos tokens during a skill test your location. Ignore the modifiers of each curse token revealed during this test. For each curse token ignored, deal one damage to an enemy at your location. Just like observe, I think people are going to put it in just so they want to change their deck. I think that's very true. <laughs> They're like, I have five experience, fuck it, I'll just put this in here. Uh, so I like Dawnstar. I actually, I actually really like Dawnstar. I think this is a good card. Um, it's basically a lucky mix with some damage for curse tokens, right? I, I think that the incorrect thing to do is to use this to wait for, um, wait for multiple curse tokens and just fire this off if you get, like, one curse token and enemies at your location, you know? Uh, you just run it and you take it and you just like, you just fire it off. Like you get the curse token. You're like, it's going to cause me to fail. Zap. I'll, I'll shoot you with the power of my dawn star, you know? And I think that's pretty sick. Chance given it a 3.8. Can I be honest? I think I kind of want to give it a 3.5. I think I kind of want to give it a, like my instinct says three, but my heart says 3.5. You know? That's kind of like where I'm sitting right now. Shout out to the person who got really pedantic about the fact that Dawnstar doesn't technically ignore curse tokens, so it doesn't deal any damage. Because <laughs> it ignores the modifiers. That's actually pretty funny. That's actually pretty funny. Fun new ignore card for Diana. That's kind of cool. That's kind of fun. Yeah, that is actually kind of fun. Fuck it, man. I'm going to give this a 3.5. I, I think this card is actually pretty good. I think you're obviously only going to play it if people are running curses, right? Um, but I do think that this is, I think, actually a pretty good card. I can definitely see me in a year looking back and giving this card a 3. And, like, being like, I was a little bit over on this one. But I want, past Ju I want future Justin to know that past Justin is happy to give this a 3.5. But if, if future Justin complains, I want you guys to back past Justin up. Because past Justin actually, you know, he, he believes this. He believes this. All right. Uh, Occult Reliquary. Let's get the poll up. I was like, what am I doing here? I have to start my poll, don't I? Uh, three experience, boon, pact, permanent limit, one per deck. You have one additional hand, accessory, or arcane slot, which can only be used to hold a bless or cursed asset. This card's good. This card is, like, super low to the ground. If you're playing any blessed or cursed items, just, like, you can pick it up and just do great things with it. Um, my gut, when I see this card, I feel like this, like I would give Charisma and Relic Hunter a five. So I'm feeling like this is going to be very close to those cards, you know? I feel like for me personally, this is going to be very close to this. Yeah, the permanent, like, ex I think, like, also, like, the arcane slot is going to, like, be pretty. Chat's giving it a 3.9. Really all over place in regards to rounding up or down with my voting. That's okay. That's on you. You're... Yeah, it's yeah. You can do it however you want. Like if you want to like change how your up your rounding up or down goes, who cares, right? Just ride the lightning, right? But the thing is, like I agree, the accessory slot is kind of weird with this card. But the fact is that you can change it. You can change it as you see fit, right? Because you don't have to decide when you buy it, right? You don't have to decide when you, like, when you buy it. You just, like, you can change, like, on the fly, right? So you can just, like, adapt to what's needing. Like, what's needed in the moment, right? You're like, okay, I have my two things, but I finally have found my, like, my blessed, uh, my blessed hand slots, and I want to run with this, you know? 
And I think that's the true power of this card is that you can just adapt on the fucking fly. Right? Like, I'm not reading that wrong. Right? Right, chat? Like, this is actually something that you can just, like, change how you see fit when you want to. Because I think that's pretty powerful. Honestly, though, I think people are going to get sick of this card in time. I'm going to give this card a 4.5. It's close to a 5 for me, but I think it's just generally a little bit less usable than Relic Hunter and uh, Charisma. So I'm going to give this one a 4.5. All right. Last card. We have Broken Diadem. All right. One second. Broken diadem. Am I saying this right? Let's, let's look. I always did this last time. Diadem. Diadem. All right. Broken diadem. We're killing it. We're killing it here, folks. All right. Limit one per deck. Uh, so, sorry. One cost, five experience. Limit one per deck. Limit one mass per investigator. His reaction after skill test or location wins him with both a, both a bless and curse token reveal. Place one resource on this card as an offering. Then, if there are three offerings on this card, search your bonded cards for Twilight Diadem. Swap it with this card, moving all offerings from this card to Twilight Diadem. Uh, when, as a reaction, when you reveal a Bless or Curse token, your skill test, spend one offering, exhaust this card, treat the revealed token as an Elder Sign instead, returning to the Chaos Bag. Then, if this card has no offering, search your bonded cards. This card's interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> I think this card's pretty interesting. That's giving it a two. Interesting. Okay, let's read this. Kohaku exclusive? No, I played the, I played this in Father Mateo. I played this in Father Mateo for sure. Because Father Mateo gets five XP that he can use at the beginning, right? I I buy this at level zero for Father Mateo, I think. Just to get the ball rolling, so then it doesn't feel bad when I have to buy it later. <laughs> so after skill this, so after you do a paradoxical, you place a resource on this card. You don't even have to do it. After someone at your location paradoxicals, you place an offering on this. Then your next blessing, three blessing curse tokens. If you do this three times, your next three blessed and curse tokens are. Are elder signs. So, Tristan Botley requires three. Right? Tristan Botley requires three symbols to be revealed. And Tristan Botleys are rare. Rarer. Paradoxicals can happen. Can you play the mask on top of another ma mask? Um... I think you can. Because it's like a compose. No, it's like a... I mean... I don't even know, actually. I don't know, to be honest. I think it's not, because it's a limit. It's like composures. You can't play another composure when you have a composure, and I think it works the same for masks. Okay. Speak to the dead can place offerings on stuff. Oh, no, that does the thing. There's nothing that places offerings. Okay, I thought there was, but there is nothing. Huh. This card's interesting to me. But Blessing of Isis is the thing that exists? Blessing of Isis is the thing that exists, but, like, why not both, right? Father Mateo's whole thing is he wants to resolve as many Elder Signs as possible. And you get Blessing of Isis going. And you get, like, Olive McBride going. I mean, Olive McBride makes it... I think this is actually pretty playable in Father Mateo. The question is, though... Is... Is that good enough for a general rating? I think this is bait for Mateo. 
Potentially, yeah. But I mean, Father Mateo will take anything at this point. Father Mateo would take anything to maybe have a build that is somewhat powerful, you know? This doesn't exhaust to get the offering. I mean, I don't think the card's good. I'm just trying to decide where in where it's going to live. I think the card's good in certain players, like certain investigators, but I don't think it's good as a whole. I think this card actually might be better than people think. But I don't think it's good. I think I'm going to give it a 2.5. So what about on Silas? The problem with Silas is that he has a hard time getting token, getting curse tokens into the bag, right? He doesn't really have like a good consistent way to get curse tokens that I can think of on the top of my head, right? Unless I'm missing something. I think this is I think this is a very fun neutral card though. I think this is a really nice design for a neutral mask for sure. However, she is wearing two masks in the art, so let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> let's talk about that for a second. Blurs require some team building anyway. I don't necessarily think that's completely true. I mean, I think that's like why Father Mateo is so interesting, because he can actually probably do the blessed thing, the blurs thing the most. He can he can really get some covenant uh, some paradoxical covenant going. I've done it. I mean, like I've done a deck and it was very successful for it. But then, then you're still playing Father Mateo. But I, once again, I think all of McBride also gets this going. I mean, also I think Kohaku, but Kohaku's Elder Sign isn't crazy, right? Kohaku's Elder Sign is pretty mid, if I remember correctly. But let's see. Maybe I'm wrong. Let's just quickly pull up. I'm I'm really going deep on this card because I think this card's actually really interesting. Yeah, uh, Kohaku's is a pretty mid-Elder Sign. It gets him an action if it triggers twice. Oh boy, an extra action. One of the strongest things you can do in the game. How mid. <laughs> How mid, Kohaku? No, it's it's pretty alright, Elder Sign. Okay. And with that... We are done. But let's look at the stats, shall we? We love stats here. All right, so uh, my overall rating, uh, my overall rating is a 3.17 for this cycle, which I think is, yeah, as I said before, this whole thing was like sitting around like a three. I think we're at a 3.06 before, so the experience cards pushed it up. Chad's giving it a 3.41. If we compare this to the initial Scarlet Keys, I was 3.33 and chat was 3.669. So the numbers were actually higher in the Scarlet Keys one. But I do actually think that Scarlet Keys is a stronger expansion than Hemlock Veil. Vale. But I think um, the power level here for Hemlock Veil vale is, pretty, is pretty good. I think this is a nice expansion that we're going to get a lot of good pieces from. Uh, my highest rated cards were Long Shot with a 5, uh, Dirty Deeds with a 5, and I think those are my only 5s today, right? Uh, not counting Investigators. Investigators are their own special thing. But we got a lot of 4.5s and 3s and, and uh, higher of all these other ones, but that's what we're looking at. That's what we're cooking with. Huge thank you to all of our patrons for supporting me and allowing me to make this content for all of you. I hope you found it uh, hope you found it amusing and I'm looking forward to us doing this again in a year to look back and see where we were right and where we were wrong and maybe it won't be three hours this time. Six hours in total for the two. That was a lot of talking about Arkham but I know you love it. If you did like it, consider liking this video. Thanks for watching. Have a good one and as always, a GG's.